welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my stream where we have a conversation between friends. Um, pretty much always it's it's me and Landon. Hey, Landon. Hi. My beautiful <laughs> face again. Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. And oh my gosh, everything looks different. What is yeah. this? What's going on today? What has happened? ESW's gotten a makeover? What is this? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> what's, what's it say right here? I don't know. Am I pointing to the right way? Um, yeah, you po point okay. up. If you point up. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. What? It's our first media episode. Yes. So for those that haven't been um, following along with our updates, um, can you explain real quick what a media episode is, since this is our very first one? Yes. So we have decided to change up a little bit about how we do this show. And once a month, we are now going to dig into and explore a piece of media that we've either enjoyed in the past or think that we would enjoy now, or that has just really taken the world by storm and dissect and discuss the inner workings of that media and see why it has affected and created fandoms as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and what about it that we love? What about it that we hate? And overall, does it resonate with us? And is it a, is it a piece of media worth investing in? Yes, we met as fandom role players. So of course, media has a big influence on the, the writing and the role playing that we do. Um, and hey, Lunar, I see you got first and welcome, Ty. So um, so I, I we're doing Harry Potter first because I kind of feel like Landon and I probably would not be friends if it were not for us both being huge Harry Potter fans. Um, we didn't meet in a Harry Potter role play. We actually met in a Once Upon a Time role play. But um, where we really became friends and became close was in a Harry Potter role play and uh, in bonding over our love for Marauders era Harry Potter. So <laughs> for those of you who do not know me, Harry Potter is actually a part of my personality trait. Uh, I've made it, I've made it a part of my personality, which means like, it's great. But at the same time, I get to recognize that there are things terribly wrong with it. So that's part of also what we wanted to do. And we didn't want to just rave about how much we love Harry Potter. We really wanted to talk about 20 years later, is this piece of media what we thought it was when we were kids, when we were becoming friends, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, everything feels a little bit different now um, later. And by the way, because this is a whole different setup, um, y'all let me know if the levels are off or anything like that. Um, tell me if like I'm too loud or if Landon's too loud or if one of us is too quiet. Um, but yeah, with that being said, today is going to be a totally different kind of episode, really not anything like what we have done in the past. Um, so before we get started, though, we have a couple of announcements and things we want to say, right, Landon? Yes, we do. So let's get started. Uh, the first thing first is that this episode of Enter Stage Window will contain Harry Potter uh, series spoilers, as well as anything in the extended works and Wizarding World universe. As much as we are focusing on the Sorcerer's Stone, we have the knowledge of 20 years worth of Harry Potter information that came out after the Sorcerer's Stone, so it's impossible for us to just really cut that bias and just focus on the Sorcerer's Stone. So. If you haven't read Harry Potter and are wanting to, this might not be the stream for you. Yeah. Um, and while we don't have it planned mentioning a lot of the Wizarding World U uh, universe works, it might come up. So overall blanketed, this is not a spoiler free episode. Yep. And most of our media streams are going to be like that, just to let you guys know, they're always going to have kind of a spoiler warning. Um, in addition to that, there's one, there's one other thing that we want to make sure that we let you guys know. Um, in, in addition to spoiler warnings, we're also going to be talking about topics involving um, past and continual abuse, child abuse, things like that. Um, in addition to child abuse, the topic of racism and bigotry is going to come up. So if any of that makes you uncomfortable, then um, just click off because I don't think it's possible to talk about Harry Potter without talking about those two things. It's kind of the core of the story. So that's what that's going to be about. And all of these warnings, you can see they're going to stay on the screen throughout the stream. So anybody that comes in should still be able to see them. They're right next to, one of them's next to Landon's camera over there, and one's next to my camera over there. So yeah, content warning as well. <laughs> um, and the final bit that we wanted to talk about is that um, over the last few years, Joanne Rowling has made abhorrent statements against the trans community. And we here at Enter Stage Window do not agree with her, do not condone it, do not, uh, 
we we condemn it in fact so we are not in support of any of her beliefs and a lot of what we wanted to make this series about is seeing if we could have seen the warning signs within the writing that she created mm -hmm. uh, and it's certainly there so we will continue to talk about that yeah but we encourage our viewers to donate to nonprofits, especially because it's Pride Month. Um, and uh, we recommend here at the, the Trevor Project, and the link is right there if you want yep. to support Trans Youth. Give.thetrevorproject.org. So um, you are still welcome, of course, if you want to, to subscribe to me and renew your subscriptions um, today. But I would encourage you, instead of doing that, if you're considering doing that today, uh, save that for another time and instead give that $5 to the Trevor Project. Um, they they need it to help our trans youth who are, are in crisis in most of the developed world and the non-developed world. Um, yeah. Welcome, Jane. So Hi, happy Jane. to have you here and thank you for the lurk irony. Um, and this is the first time actually that I have engaged with anything Harry Potter related since um, the manifesto, we'll call it. So if you don't know what that is, um, basically that was JK Rowling's large statement on how she feels about trans women which is very negatively to say the least um and so you know seeing that and uh experiencing something harry potter afterwards definitely had an effect on me so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is with that perspective yes absolutely and we're not going to sit there and separate it or anything like that we are going to acknowledge it um, and we will continue to say as many times as we need to that we support the trans community. Yes. Um, All right, let's get into it. Let's do it. So uh, traditionally here at Enter Speed Window, we start our podcasts or our, our streams with favorite things. But since this is a media focused episode and we're not really reviewing the literature or the media that we're engaging in, I do think it is important for us to talk about our favorite things of the media that we just uh, devoured. So mm -hmm. Karen, tell me what was your favorite thing about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone? Okay, so you can probably see on the screen now, um, and here we go, here's a little cameo from Oreo. <laughs> He's been behind me, but she says hi. <laughs> um, age of kittens is shoulder kitten age oh my god um but my favorite thing in harry potter and we'll talk about this more when we talk about the world building that takes place is christmas at hogwarts um jk rowling the way that she describes locations is just absolutely magical i i love it and my favorite description is um of christmas at hogwarts of, of the feast that they describe of the way that they've got snow falling in the in the great hall all of the lights all of the, the christmas tree it's just to me when I read that passage, I can't help myself. I remember all of the reasons that I first fell in love with Harry Potter and why to this day, it's still one of my favorite book series. So that is my favorite thing in the whole first book. Landon, what's yours? Mine is the amount of tension building that exists within this novel, specifically in the Forbidden Forest. Uh, J.K. Rowling did a great job really engaging uh, the audience when writing this scene in these chapters about like, oh, this is scary and spooky and things are happening in a way that I don't really think children literature tends to gra grapple adults. Uh, and it was really, it was really nice to read and really fun to be like, even after all these years, all of these times reading it really in still like sucked in to this part of the book is a lot of fun. Uh, so that was definitely my favorite thing. Oh, uh, I love again, that. I think the thing that connects these two things is she has a great way of world building. We're mm -hmm. world building, you know, something as simple as the Great Hall during Christmas time to something as complicated and scary as the Forbidden Forest. I think that that world building really is, as I said, we will discuss later in the in the stream, but is something that is obviously a a link here. Yep. The descriptions of locations that exist within the Harry Potter books are some of, I mean, some of the best, like, you know, that's spanning children's literature, YA, adult literature. It's just, they're really stinking good, <laughs> you know? Um, and thank you so much, Lunar. You know, y'all don't have to do that, but I really appreciate it. So I'll be on the lookout for those packages. Yeah, but like, 
even now, even with all the anger that I have towards her and towards the things that she said, and even towards certain things now that I see differently in the books, the way that those locations are described, it's all, it all kind of just like goes to the back burner when I read those descriptions. And that just really speaks to, um, to the, the craft of those particular pieces of the book and how good they are. And I can see why, um, why basically everybody wants to be a wizard at Hogwarts when you read these yeah. books. Like everybody's like, I want to go to there, I you want know? To be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, time for something really interesting in the chapter, which I think is a great segue for us. Something that escapes me as is how Harry Potter got as big as it did. I get why people like the books, but I don't get why the kind of Harry Potter is the best ever. And I think what this really has to do and what we need to like express in this is how Harry Potter changed a lot of things and changed the world. And in order to do that, let us take a moment to discuss the state of children's literature uh, pre-Harry Potter in 1997. So something that is very important to understand about children's literature is that in 1997, there was, or, and prior to Harry Potter, there were really only a few sub-genres that existed underneath children, the umbrella of children's literature. And the most popular of the genre was the mystery genre. Uh, and every single person here has heard of a mystery uh, children's book. I guarantee it. Goosebumps. Goosebumps. How to talk to the <laughs> <Jeez. dark>. Uh, <laughs> Yomi and Soda Pop. Okay. Uh, how to tell stories in the dark. Um, even Magic Treehouse has some elements of that mystery genre. Um, and so really what the purpose of children's literature was, was to post and, and have these multi-book series that existed with the same formula within each book. So again, Goosebumps, Nancy Drew, Junie B. Jones, uh, none of, not all of these were mystery, but all of them kind of had a kind of mystery to it, but they all carried the same formula. Every single book is the exact same. Yep. And they There's were, a reason for this. Yeah. There's a reason. Um, they were successful because each book followed this formula. So new books could be written every couple of months mm -hmm. uh, by ghost writers. Uh, and it made it really cheap and easy for publishers in the literature in the publishing industry to pick three or four ghostwriters at a time to say you're going to be working on a Judy B. Jones book you're going to be working on a Judy B. Jones book and you're going to be working on it and it's going to come out in June August and September <laughs> yep and they would all be working on them at the same time and and the the whole reason why this this happened is because the way that the market was at that time it was all about the scholastic book fair so who remembers the scholastic book fairs Definitely me. They were they were great. You know, the Scholastic Book Fair, like a, a trailer would basically come to your school and they'd set up, you'd go in and it had this wonderful paperback book smell. And you'd walk in and there would be like all of these books that you could choose from. And you would go and you would be like, oh, I got to get the new Babysitter's Club. I don't have that one yet. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and that's basically how children's literature worked because the whole point was every month when the Scholastic Book Fair comes around to your school, you want the kids to be able to buy the new book of their favorite series, right? Yeah. And you needed to have a new one every month for very cheap that these kids could afford on their lunch money. So you would get basically these, uh, these, these books where you would have an author who would set out, you know, the outline of the book overall, and they might write a few books here and there in the series, like they might write like the big book that comes out in the summer, you know, of whatever series, yeah. right? But, um, but all of the in-between ones that would come out during the school year would be written by these ghostwriters, because then they could turn around and sell them for like $5 or whatever, and they would make buku bucks if that series got popular. Yeah, and the thing that that was necessary for this to be successful then is that the plot of the books were the most important, that it followed this genre. There was a mystery, kids went to solve it, kids solved it. There yep. was no- And they, they, weren't, they didn't tie in, like they didn't have to follow yeah. a storyline from because book they, to book. Because they wanted to be able to jump between ghostwriter to ghostwriter. 
Yep. So it really was this idea of don't develop your characters. And the other thing that made this incredibly special is that kids could jump in at any point of the series. If you were a first through third grader who picked up any of the Magic Tree House books, you could pick up any single one of them and engage in it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do that with a adult series or with the Harry Potter series. You need the context of the previous books. These mystery genres, these, these children literature books did not require any individual uh, information when going into these books, which yeah. was so important to engage the target audience with the intention of the target audience never growing with the series. No. So the series would never change. People would just, children would just grow out and age out into the next series. So I'll give an example of my favorite ones of these series that followed this formula. Animorphs. Okay, if y'all know, if y'all know me, I haven't talked about it on stream very much, but Animorphs was like the like one of the, my favorite series growing up. It's it's amazing. Like why it's not more popular now, I don't understand. But it followed this formula, but it did have kind of an overall story. But because of this formula, what that meant at the time is that the the main antagonist of the books um, was called the the Yurks, and basically they're these body snatching slugs that get into you and take you over. Okay, oh. and um, yeah, that was awesome. But uh, even in the final book of the series, they re-explain what the Yerks are because literally the way that this formula works, you have to assume that some 10-year-old picked up any book at any time and just jumped in. So there would be passages that would like get repeated like almost exactly in like every other book. So, but of course... That's not how Harry Potter is. If you jump in and try to read book four of Harry Potter, yeah, you can probably pick up some stuff from context clues, but you don't really know what's going on. You would not enjoy it. <laughs> no, it would be like, it would, it would not be good. It would be really weird. Um, so what Harry Potter did when it was invented and introduced into the market was it created this marriage. It was a children's book and Sorcerer's Stone is a children's book. We'll talk about that in a second. But it was a series, it was a children's book that broke genre and formula, which kind of allowed children's literature and adult fantasy to be married. Um, this, this didn't really exist before. What is now known as the genre of YA did exist. However, YA certainly didn't have the market that it was that it is today. And often the books that existed within the young adult genre uh, were realistic fiction books. So think of Catcher in the Rye, To Kill a Mockingbird. Those books were what made up the young adult uh, genre or the young adult market. Like if you uh, liked horror, for example, you went straight from Goosebumps to Stephen King. Yeah, absolutely. There was no in between. And fantasy, there was no in between. I mean, you had to engage. There wasn't even in between because there wasn't a lot of childhood fantasy, ha child literature fantasy happening uh, in books. You really just had to jump into adult fantasy, which is, depending on the author that you have, incredibly difficult to engage in. So, um, yeah, so some, some of uh, the YA books did hold themes and genres that we see today. Uh, most definitely post-apocalyptic genre, like The Giver, but most of the time it was really rare and series didn't exist. The only series that is comprehensible to the Harry Potter series that existed in before 1997 that really matches it is uh, Narnia. Um, only but one that I can then, really think of. But even then, Narnia, the thing that was unique about Narnia is that it was the world that existed within Nar Narnia. Throughout the nine books, or seven books, one of the two, uh, they're all different characters. Harry Potter flips that. It exists in the same world, but you follow all the characters. So really, Harry Potter was this new thing to happen in children's literature. Yeah, it really, it really was and felt like, and I think the intention was, that this was going to be Lord of the Rings for kids. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. So and Harry Potter comes along. <laughs> And it changed the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. It. You do. You want? I've been talking a lot. So yeah. You I'll take this one. I'll take this one. All right. Okay. So the financial power of young adults. 
So the amount of money that Harry Potter made as far as selling books to kids was like unheard of at the time. And uh, and you probably if you're a fan of Harry Potter, you've got you've heard before, right. Like you've heard how many times Harry Potter was rejected from publishers that didn't understand what they had. Well, they didn't understand what they had because publishers, of course, they're there to make money. They're risk averse. Just like everybody that's existing to make money, once they find a formula, they repeat that and repeat that and repeat that until it's just um, totally dead and can't make them any money anymore, right? Well, Harry Potter was a formula that didn't exist. So publishers see that and they're like, mm, yeah, no, this is unproven. This is untested. We're not, we're going to pass, you know, bye. So when Harry Potter, when the first book did come out and it was an amazing success, and made all that money and, uh, and and sold as much as it did, like it shocked publishers. But really, like if you make something popular for that age group, like it shouldn't be shocking. Making something popular for, for kids and preteens is always been a money maker, right? Like that's why a lot of Saturday morning cartoons had like crazy toy tie-ins, you know, like Transformers and things like that. So um, it shouldn't have been surprised, but it was totally a surprise and and basically it 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 boils down to you know kids have this book that they like most parents are going to be like a book reading of course i'll buy it for you child you can have this i'll buy every single one as it comes out you know um so that's that's what harry potter tapped into it tapped into the uh the financial power that uh that kids and preteens and uh and young teenagers had so yeah. And oh, and Ty, I see your comment on self-publishing. Self-publishing wasn't really a, a thing at that time. You know, like you really, there, the internet wasn't like it was, like that just wasn't, you know, it wasn't a thing. Um, but after Harry Potter, so after Harry Potter, um, this whole genre blew up, right? Without Harry Potter, imagine Twilight. Imagine the Hunger Games, right? Like I can't, like, what would that even look like? Yeah, so it what what this did is it, it like permanently changed the market itself, right? It broke the New York Times bestselling list, so that New York Times bestselling list actually decided actively not to be based on a uh, weekly sales and instead be based on other qualifications because Harry Potter was selling so much that it would blow the entire list away on multiple categories, not just children's literature. Uh, so they had to change that. They had to change uh, how publishing houses, how they viewed books and how books can be consumed. So absolutely, Twilight, Hunger Games, um, Divergent series, all of these books existed because the market blew wide open by the understanding of what Harry Potter could do, like that something could be as successful as Harry Potter. If and it marketed. only got worse. And it only got worse when the movie started coming out. Oh, right? absolutely. Because then, yeah, everything suddenly got a movie. Yep. If you had a popular book series that um, that had the target audience of like preteens and young teenagers, oh man, you were getting a movie. It was like, you got a movie and you got a movie and you got a movie. Everybody gets a movie. Right? And, that, and that's continued. I mean, we see that now with Netflix TV series. We see that with home movies. Like that is something that still has ramifications within the market. Uh, yeah. That YA is being picked up all over the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so not only that, but it also changed how stores started marketing clothing. So uh, they realized the spending financial power of young adults when it came to the book industry and companies then expanded upon it outside of the book industry and movie industry. So things like Hot Topic and Spencer's and certain parts of like mass deals within, tar in, within like sub stores of Target. Can I just say, can I just say real quick, I, when I was, when I was a kid, Hot Topic was for the, the wannabe goth kids and Spencer's was for sex toys. So I don't know what happened, but I blame, I do blame Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. Happened. Harry Potter <laughs> happened and now Hot Topic is fandom. That's yep. not how it was when I was coming along. But you know, once the movie started getting rolling, um, then uh, that's what Hot Topic became. It was, it was now fandom merch. I, and that's what I remember is I remember loving walking in there because it was still that mix of dark, but also I could find Harry Potter stuff. Uh, so really it like stores changed to include all of that. And this was all because of one book series. Like it happened quickly after 1997. 
um, or after probably after the second book came out is really when the series started picking up. Uh, but th these ramifications happened quickly in the early 2000s. Um, so yeah, it, it, it also gave power to, the, to understanding that this age group 13 to 21 was a huge untapped market that, that was originally written off as those kids don't read to, oh no, these kids have an enormous amount of money and love reading. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So we then go into how did it change children's literature? So that's how it changed the world. How does it change children's literature? Um, so I think first and foremost, we need to talk about that Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone is children's literature. When we think of the whole Harry Potter series, we think of young adults but there is a distinct difference between children's literature and young adult literature. And, and it's Harry hard to remember, Potter. you know, after you read the whole series, because um, I know I experienced it the first time I went back and reread the series. This was actually a long time ago, but this is what I remember. Because by the time you get to the end of the end of the books, they really are young adult books, right? So yeah. when you go back and you and you read the Sorcerer's Stone after reading the last book, it's just kind of like, what? <laughs> And we'll get into it with some of our specific con comments, but there's certain things in there that are just like, this doesn't make any sense. This is really silly. I don't understand why why they would do this. What? You know, and it's really because Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was children's literature. So we'll get into this more as we kind of progress through the books, because don't worry, there's going to be more Harry Potter episodes. Um, but uh, I feel like this book and then the next one are really children's literature. And after that is when the stakes start to raise, particularly in book four, the stakes shoot way up, you know. But in this first book, like, yeah, a troll comes in and attacks them. Yeah, they have to protect the Sorcerer's Stone, you know, from Voldemort and all this stuff. But they're really like, let's be real. There's no stakes. There's no stakes in this first one. There's never any real danger. <laughs> or like, and even the characters, and if there are stakes, I feel like the stakes were then put in after, as an afterthought, right? They, um, yeah, it feels like afterthought, so, yeah. Like this idea of Harry suddenly at the end of the book, and we're going we're gonna to give a quick, synopsis of the book in a second so that if you haven't read Sorcerer's Stone recently you can have those memories spiked or at least you understand what's going on but at the end of the book Harry is suddenly granted this amazing power that the person like who is housing Voldemort's body dies when he's touched by Harry and that's never acknowledged in the book <laughs> like that's never even acknowledged about the fact that Harry straight up kills a man like yep. <laughs> Harry kills a man and literally the only acknowledgement it gets is Dumbledore saying it's a secret so naturally everyone knows so, <laughs> so it's like the knows whole school knows Harry Potter, Potter just killed a guy on accident <laughs> what um very quickly do we want to give the synopsis now I feel like yeah that yeah was... yeah because we're going to keep mentioning specific things so yeah give give the synopsis so if it's been a while since you've read Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone this is what happened Harry Potter is a introduced as an isolated child with no friends, having experienced no love, and has mysterious powers that he doesn't correlate to with his doing. So odd things just happen around him. Yet they uh, continue to happen, most certainly in times when he is distressed. It is when he receives a letter at the Dursley's house uh, that he, and when the Dursleys then are panicked and confused at this letter, and he isn't allowed to read it, that he realizes that there is information being hidden from him. The Dursleys and him, who are his aunt and uncle, go on a wild goose chase, chase uh, trying to hide from these magical letters that keep showing up. And that's when a mysterious man named Hagrid, who is a half giant, shows up and speaks the infamous line, you're a wizard, Harry. Uh, and from there, Harry's life is turned completely upside down. He attends a, a uh, magical boarding school for his first year at Hogwarts, uh, where he encounters in just his first year alone, a giant three-headed dog, an escaped forest troll in the woman's bathroom, a cursed broomstick, a dragon's egg, a mysterious figure drinking cursed unicorn blood, a whole so society of centaurs, a, uh, the epitome of tall, blonde, racist, and daddy issues of Draco Malfoy, and a monstrous left leftover uh, of an antagonist of an antagonist of the novel, uh, Severus Snape, 
that lives to just take Harry Potter's house points away. Uh, and this, of course, leads up to Ron, Hermione, and Harry, all of whom are friends, uh, solving these challenges and adventures to save the Sorcerer's Stone from the hands of a, the Potions Master, only to discover that it was not the Potions Master who we have been told is the antagonist all along, but in fact, the other professor that has been me mentioned twice <laughs> or three <laughs> times at that point. Uh, and from there, Harry uh, defeats him by touching him uh, and discovers that he has yet another superpower that he doesn't know about. And that is the power of love uh, in which he kills his professor and is told that it is fine um, stopping the big bad Voldemort coming back to life and everything turns out fine and Harry discovers that he can go back to his abusive normal family and bully his cousin back. That's what happened. <laughs> That's the story of Harry Potter. So, and, I, um, and you know, if I could kill people by just like giving them a handshake or a light hug, I mean, I don't know, like that might do some things to my mind. I'm just saying. That might inflate my ego just <laughs> ever so slightly I but yeah just... um in in addition to that so everything we've talked about so far is that it's pretty clear um just one quick comment before we do the hero's journey it's pretty clear at this point that like editors didn't care they didn't know they were just like this is some weird kids literature and it's probably gonna flop like a good example of this that landon um that you brought up was um the wizarding money there's yeah. like this throwaway line about the wizarding money and it's very confusing and it doesn't make any sense and and these are peppered throughout the book this is just a really good example of it just stuff that like if an editor really thought this book was going to be something and do something they would have been like cut that it's pointless you know there's no point in it and you will regret having to make these calculations for the next seven books yes and we all do. All of us that write Harry Potter fanfic do. <laughs> we're like, oh, we're just going to use Harry Potter credit cards. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, or do what J.K. Rowling does and that never mention money again, except to say someone's poor. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, it, is, it is that idea. And it's also that so much happens. This is the shortest book. This is the shortest book. Uh, and that's what makes it children's literature is the amount of stuff that happens. Every single chapter has an adventure in itself. Every single chapter is a huge, big deal with a rising uh, action climax and resolution, uh, which is something that's very common in children's literature because you need to keep kids engaged. Um, there's this idea that kids can't be engaged unless something exciting is going on. Uh, so yeah. that is a telltale sign of children's literature right there. And it happens consistently through this book. That is why there is more adventure happening in this entire book than the next two books combined. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's I, like, you know, it's, it's a, cool, a cool thing every chapter. A cool, crazy thing every single chapter. Which is fun to read. But when you're trying to write a synopsis that won't take the entire two hours of the stream, it's really difficult. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah yes so, it is <laughs> so hero's journey this is also something this hero's journey is not prevalent to only children's literature and young adult literature it is faculty throughout modern day fiction to the classics like the hero's journey is this idea of this man or woman or protagonist who has to go through this journey of of trial and error and failure and success and and sacrifice to end up being successful and revered and loved. Uh, they usually start out very unloved and find worth through all of these actions. Um, that You've is got a classic hero's journey here in Harry Potter, which is why at the end, of course, he goes back to the Dursleys. Every book is a hero's journey. The entire series taken as a step back is a hero's journey. There's a lot of a journey through this. And that is something that really, while it is most common in children and YA literature, it is found in all aspects, but that is something that ties it to that children's literature, that need of, it is it is a children's book because there's a fable to it in a way. Um, yeah. And then- All right. Let's talk about how, we, we mentioned like forever ago that these are mystery books, right? That yes. this is a mystery books. 
However, <laughs> unlike, um, you know, maybe a Goosebumps book or some other a Nancy Drew book or something like that, uh, this is Harry Potter and the Unsolvable Mystery, right? Yeah. So Snape is presented as the antagonist all the way through. And then at the end, it's like, bam, it's Quirrell. What? Crack. And there's literally no clues. There's no clues. It's like there's this throwaway line where Hermione bumps into Quirrell that you can catch upon a reread and some stuff like that. But but nowhere does Harry have any experiences or the reader is let in on anything that Harry doesn't know um, that could point you towards Quirrell. It's very much like what I like to call a Shyamalan mystery. It is. There's, yes. there's a twist at the end and you only can catch the clues on a second watch. You can't possibly catch the clues on a first watch. It's just not set up that way. So in reality, I would say like this is not a mystery in the traditional sense because it doesn't it gives you like these puzzles to solve that you can't possibly solve. Well, and and Harry Harry himself doesn't solve it. Yeah. It, Harry solves it by walking in and saying, "Oh, you I'm here for Snape. And Quirrell is like, oh, it was never Snape. Mm -hmm. Like it is, it, it is a twist. It's an absolute classic twist. However, it is not a mystery. Um, and that really, that really breaks genre. That breaks the genre rules. This is advertised when it came out in 1997 was advertised and trying to capture the mystery uh, readers. It was really marketed as a mystery. It was a high fantasy or a fantasy mix mystery at least for children's literature and it wasn't it broke all the rules of what a mystery entails in writing yeah yep. um which is not a bad thing i think again that's what made people love it because oops, sorry the train is so loud oh you're good <laughs> um yeah i think people really did like it and they liked it for the same exact reason that um, people loved, you know, Sixth Sense before we got tired of like, okay, this is every single movie is the same thing. Like, come on now, um, you know. <laughs> so people, people love to be surprised, and you can't help but be surprised in Harry Potter. And when you, even on a reread, like you still get all of those feelings about like how awful Snape is and how how much you you know you want him to go down in the end and all of these things. Like that's still set up. But yeah. yeah. No, it it absolutely is like it's still it's still set up. It still has all of these clues. Yep. Um. Now let's get into some some fun details. Uh, and I think that I think that if we're discussing Harry Potter and diving into this series where we're going to continue to discuss Harry Potter through seven books, that we have to at least discuss the character. Yeah. Um. And that is Harry Potter, the boy who was abused. Not the boy who lived, the boy who was abused. Um, That's really what he goes through in the books. Constant and regular constant, abuse cycles. Constant and consistent abuse uh, from every adult and the wizarding world itself. So the uh, first one's obvious, right? Yeah. He's living with the Dursleys. He's the, you know, the, the black sheep of the family. Um, they mistreat him overtly. Uh, he literally lives under the stairs. He doesn't even get his own room, you know. Um, and uh, and that's that's how he lived his entire first 11 years of his life, being told that you are worse. Um, basically, he's got he's got uh, his cousin Dudley, who the reason why apparently Harry Potter is unpopular at school is because Dudley tells everyone to hate him. We never see this. This is just Harry's perception, right? Um, but I just want us to keep in mind when we're talking about Harry's early life that Dudley's a victim too, okay? The way that um, Vernon and, uh, oh gosh, the, the mom's name escapes yeah. me, Petunia. The way that Vernon and, Vernon and Petunia each uh, treat uh, Dudley um, is abusive as well. You mm -hmm. know, they're, they're constantly making sure that he is set up for failure by just getting whatever he wants with no effort. And uh, at some point, Dudley's entire world is going to come crashing down, and that's going to be really horrible for him. So, well, and you know, it, the way and that the Dursleys does, raise these kids is just awful. Yeah, and I mean, it does in the, we see a flash forward of that because it does in the first book. Uh, Vernon, Vernon tells Dudley no for the first time in his life. And that's what Harry like even sees too, is that Vernon is in this panic because these letters are coming in from Hogwarts and they know what it means, but Harry doesn't know what it means. And Vernon wants to go on the run. Uh, so Dudley says, no, I want to watch my television show. 
and Vernon shuts him down. It's the first time Dudley has ever been shut down in his life. Dudley tries all of his tactics and Vernon res- res- like reduces himself to physical violence. He shoves Dudley away, tells him to get a hold of himself and Dudley is stunned. He doesn't know how to deal with that. And he is then physically, ab- uh, like he is then abused. Like you see the abuse for the rest of the, the book that you see him in. Yep. Um, so really, yeah, Dur- Dur- Dudley Dursley is an abuse is an abuse victim as well. Um, yeah, so there's not only physical abuse, there's emotional abuse, uh, there's verbal abuse. We see all examples of this. However, in none of the books, it is ever acknowledged as an abuse. Uh, and something that makes this even worse is that we flash to the first thing that we are introduced to as a reader is recognizing that there are three adults who know this family is abusive, who know that this yeah, is- Yeah, McGonagall be- says it. She says it. He's like, they're and, the worst sort. Yep. What do you and think that still, means? And still consents for Harry to be put and raised into that situation. Oh, but they're his only family, her, as if that matters. Which is another example of how the adults in Harry's life are abusing him. Yeah. And it doesn't stop, okay? Like, it doesn't stop. He it has these experiences in his early life, and then he goes into the wizarding world, and it's the same freaking thing. It's the same yeah. thing, right? We have this we have this beautiful honeymoon period, right, where um, Hagrid has, gets him this birthday cake, and then he takes him, you know, to show, show Harry, like, hey, you actually do have money and status in this world, and, and here we're going to go shopping. And it's just like, it's just this very classic, hey, We've, you know, things have been crappy between us for a few weeks. Let's, you know, do something nice. It's literally an abuse honeymoon period, right? Where When he's in Diagon Alley with Hagrid before he actually arrives at Hogwarts. And uh, and when he arrives at Hogwarts, of course, you end up with um, all of these other adults in his life that uh, that are just as abusive as uh, Vernon and Petunia were, right? Yeah. Uh, and who, who prefer, like who who continue to abuse him in the same ways, and then the system itself is allowing that abuse. Right. Um, the abuse that happens to Harry in this book specifically is direct. It is from character to Harry. Uh, you can see it. You can see it in the way that Snape insults him. You can see it in the way that the Dursleys torture him. You can see it in the way that he is starved. You can see it in the way of the reaction of other people to like his situation, how Ron reacts, how Molly reacts to seeing Harry. Um, you can see that the, these abuse cycles are happening to Harry directly and that they're visible to everyone around him. I mean, that's the uh, whole point I, of, of, of Snape basically in, in this yeah. book is to continue Harry's abuse. Yeah, so. and, and, and this is not something that will go away. Uh, we will continue as we dissect these these books will continue to talk about the ways that Harry is being abused. This is the most overt situation and scenarios that we directly see. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is, is, is even, even like Dumbledore does it, right? Like Harry starts asking him questions oh, and Dumbledore's Dumbledore. like, basically says, I'll tell you when you're older. I mean, Dumbledore is the worst perpetrator. Dumbledore is also the one who set this all up, right? And we're going to have, when we get to Dumbledore, when we get to book six, we'll, ha- we'll have a full discussion on Dumbledore and all of the terribleness. I mean, we're even going to talk about him a little bit in this one. But he is the perpetrator of Harry's abuse. Uh, because at the end of the day, spoiler alerts for the future books, if Harry was not abused, Harry would not have been willing to die. Um, end of story. <laughs> and he needed yep. to be willing to die. That's the thing that he needed for. So the results of these abuse that we see Harry go through as adult, like as readers who are adults understanding what is happening to this character. Um, we see that Harry is a terribly awful, no good, very bad friend. Uh, yep. The way he treats every single person whom he calls a friend is terrible. And I just, I don't have one, one, one rant about this real quick. Oh, yeah. Okay. Harry's inner monologue about oh, Hermione God. in particular is absolutely abhorrent. 
Like, I mean, one of the things that makes me prefer movie Harry over book Harry is that in the movies, you don't get to be privy to all of his awful, nasty thoughts about Hermione. And he even does it to Ron sometimes, too. Like, basically, um, putting thinking that Ron's kind of lesser, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, but it's really prevalent when it comes to Hermione. Like, he's constantly critiquing Hermione's voice. He's constantly critiquing her her looks. He's constantly um, critiquing her her mind, like how dare she know things and be good at things. Um, it's just it's just regular and constant. And he doesn't even he doesn't even like her. Like he reluctantly becomes her friend after they all share the traumatic experience with the troll. If it wasn't for that experience, they wouldn't be friends with Hermione. Like they literally just trauma bonded with her, and that's it. He doesn't even like her. He doesn't even like her. Which is a great just line, by the way, that it's like, it's one of my favorite lines, but it's like so fucked up to take a look at it. And it's like, there are just some things that you go through uh, where you have to be, you come out the other side having to be friends. Yes. And fighting a troll was one of them. And it's like, you don't actually have to be her friend, Terry. She deserves better. It's fine. She does deserve better. You know what? Hermione might be annoying, but she's 11. Everyone's annoying at 11. I'm sorry. And you're an ass and you're an asshole harry so like it's true yeah. he's annoying too um so yeah harry's harry's a pretty awful friend and um and we're probably going to keep bringing this kind of stuff up because um i'll just tell you all my personal opinion my least favorite character in harry potter is harry potter <laughs> he's yeah, the I worst the, i think the most accurate portrayal of harry potter is uh a harry potter musical mm -hmm. um and they weren't trying to be accurate but they were <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, I so, agree and then of course the worst the worst person that he the person he treats the worst is the person he treats the worst that is supposedly an ally and a friend is Neville Longbottom oh yeah um and Neville Longbottom and this is referred to later and I don't know if this is J.K. Rowling like I don't think J I'm not giving J.K. Rowling any credit especially this early in the book series um but Neville, we learn later, is supposed to be Harry if Harry wasn't the chosen one. Yeah, she didn't know that at this point, you know. <laughs> but think about how terribly Harry thinks of Neville as like a way that he also views himself. It's very, it's very terrible because the way that he talks about Neville is that Neville is slow, that Neville is not smart, that Neville is sad, that Neville is just someone to be pitied. Um, and it's like this terror like when you look into it with the context of the higher series and also as the like adult perspective looking in and and dissecting children's literature you're like wow harry you have some really deep self-loathing issues uh -huh. <laughs> um and your author set you up to have those i'm so sorry mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes so so that uh and then of course there is also like how people how harry views his enemies um the harry's opinion of snape is uh we'll get into that i think in a second because we're going to talk about snape so we'll talk about that in a second but the other person is draco malfoy and harry's opinion of draco malfoy is very much like this boy is no better than dudley which is how draco had been set up to be Draco was supposed to be Hogwarts version of Dudley. Um, but it's like, there's a lot of weird emotional feelings like of the intense hatred and willingness to also repay Draco's actions in the same way. But because it's from Harry's perspective, it's noble. So like Harry going out and willing to duel him is such an 11 year old thing, I know. But at the same time, they're gonna go like, fight. <laughs> yeah. Gonna go fight. But because they're going to go fight Draco Malfoy, it's good. And so therefore they can do anything they want in order to go do that. Even though like, no, you're literally going to go fight and beat up somebody else. Like you're no better here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, inherently, obviously, Harry is the protagonist and Draco is the antagonist and Draco is a terrible person. So obviously Harry is like, morally better but at the same time the way that he views himself better even though his actions are just as similar as Draco's is again that just effect of the abuse that he has had 
well, it's, it's kind of like it was kind of like because harry understands why he would want to do it and so yeah. he can he can justify it within himself but he doesn't really know draco so he doesn't know why draco would want, would want to do these things so he is he's making assumptions because he's not in you know he's not in draco's head which so. is totally fine but again it's setting up that that um perspective of how Dudley is not a victim. Yep. Draco is also not is is also a, or how Dudley is a victim. Draco is also a victim, but yep. we don't we don't learn that yet though. And Harry's not capable of seeing that. Right. Uh, which is fine. Again, it's that eleven year old perspective. Yep. And but and we learn you know Draco gets more of a backstory later where we we learn all of this stuff about uh about why he is the way he is you know. But let's talk about Snape. Let's talk about Snape. So this is as Landon said, the Wizarding World's Vernon. Um, and he's the antagonist of the first book. I love myself a villain. I cannot stand Severus Snape, the irredeemable hero. hero. Um, so you know how much how much of a Harry hater I am. Landon's like that, except for except for with Severus Snape. So I'm sure. I'm gonna have to be here raw yeah. rawing for for Severus <laughs> guys against Landon. Sorry. <laughs> what makes him particularly terrible in this one is that this is a children's literature book which means that there is no redemption for the antagonist. There isn't in children's literature. You are meant to follow the protagonist and complex villains are, don't exist because complexity shouldn't exist. So Severus Snape's role within this novel is to be a bully, to be a Vernon Dursley, uh, and to just then, um, make Harry's life miserable by taking points away from him and possibly yep. plotting to kill him. Like that is the, that is the development we get of Severus Snape in this book. Yep. Uh, and also being a terrible teacher. <laughs> yeah, he's a terrible teacher. Oh my God. Like I, <laughs> like looking back, looking back at this, like the scene that we get of Severus Snape's classroom versus um, Madame Hooch's classroom is just like night and day. So um, it's basically kind of like, how does Severus have a job? Like, why is he still there? He literally doesn't teach. He he basically sets up his classroom for the students to fail. And it's not that like, you know, when it was being written that J.K. Rowling didn't know how teachers should behave in a classroom because you get this parallel scene with Madame Hooch where she instructs them and she gives them time to practice. And then when a kid gets injured, she immediately goes and, and acts on that to try to fix the situation. You know, she has reasonable rules in her classroom. She sets expectations. She explains the what's in it for me. You know, like she she does all the things that teachers do in her scene. And, uh, and Snape does none of that. Snape's just like, well, you don't already know this stuff. So too bad, so sad, that sucks to be you. And it's just, it's kind of mind blowing um, when you think about how rich the world building is and how Dumbledore is set up to be this, uh, this character that's like wise and he's doing all the right things and he's, he's wonderful. He's the best ha headmaster that Hogwarts has ever had. And yet he employs this man who couldn't teach anyone anything to save his life. How the hell students ever pass their potions like owls and other tests? I have no clue Never. because there's no way they're learning anything. They learn from favoritism. That's how. <laughs> um, uh, it's just it's just impossible. It's impossible to learn anything in Snape's classroom. It's it is absolutely impossible. Um, and it's and again, it's not a Jake and Rowling thing. This is how she has set up the the novel. This is how mm -hmm. she has set up. This is how she has set it up. Um. It's not a good choice. <laughs> again, it's again recognizing and forgiving because this is a children's literature novel. Um, but it goes to show that this is another, yet another example that like the publishers had no fucking clue no. that this was going to hit big because if they did, they would have developed Severus Snape. They yeah. would have started putting, started asking for depth because I think what this really shows also is Joanne's inability to give characters depth without help. Help, And I think that Snape is one of those examples in this book mm -hmm. um, yeah. because she doesn't need to. She doesn't feel the need to. She doesn't, with any of these antagonists, she doesn't feel the need to. Yeah, they're children's again, books, so why would she? 
Exactly. Uh, and and no editor, as they will later in the novels, um, no editor stopped her because they were like, no one's going to give a shit. <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> they didn't know. They thought this was going to be a huge flop. So they do not help they, her. They thought this was going to be something. It was a small, yeah. it was a small ass company who wanted something representing at the Scholastic Book, book Fair. Like that's what was happening. Like Penguin was nothing in that, those days. Um, not the way it is now. Certainly not the way it, it is now. So it yeah. was it was a very startup publishing, and and Harry Potter made it. Like they there's been talks about that this publishing company was made because of Harry Potter. Uh, mm -hmm. So at that point they were just trying to fill out their catalog with anybody who would give them a book deal, uh, yeah. and this this was inherently a good book, and 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 would have sold, but not to the extent that it did. Yeah, well, uh, I mean they they knew it would have an audience, but. They just, they didn't think it was going to be popular like this. So what, so you, no, what you end up with is instead of being shown through like um, Severus's character development or motivations or anything like that, um, you basically just get told. Like Hagrid just says, no, nah, Snape wouldn't do that. He would never do that. It, it's yeah. fine. Y'all just don't understand him. And it's like, well, then Hagrid explain it to them. <laughs> explain it to them if they don't get it. If there's some reason, tell us. But we never learned that. It's fine. It's a tragedy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we end but up yeah. with this character. We end up with this character, which, um, you know, God rest his soul and and, and bless him, played by the um, you know, the uh, oh, the char ever charismatic who, Alan Rickman, who, who I uh, percent <laughs> believe people love Alan Rickman. Rickman would not like Snape if Snape was played by anybody else. You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Because I basically didn't have strong feelings about Snape until the first movie came out. You know, he was just kind of like antagonist number two, you know, it was like, whatever. Um, So I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, uh, and, and, and in the movies, they kind of fix this a little bit, you know, as far as making sure that people can understand where he's coming from. They add in a scene between him and Quirrell, basically, in the movie. And that's one of those things that, like, when I saw it in the movie, it's like, that should have been in the book. Wait, did they? Yeah. There's a little, there's a tiny little exchange. You know, in the book, that exchange between Snape and Quirrell, where you only hear part of the conversation, and it really sounds like Snape's the bad guy and Quirrell's trying to stop him? Yeah, I thought that that was, that took place in the Forbidden Forest, and then they moved to a hallway, but was it a different conversation that they were having in the movie? It's I'm been pretty a while. sure the exchange is slightly different. Okay, cool. I, I have not recently watched the movie. so I just I, watched the movie yesterday. And I was like, I when I just watched, I just watched the movie yesterday and, uh, and the exchange is slightly different. And it, it, it might be the way that it's filmed. Um, I would have to go back and double check. Uh, but you do get a little bit of a sense that like, Severus is trying to do the right thing. And you, you never hear anything about that in, in the books. In the books, it's like, always Severus doing the wrong thing. And, um, and maybe Quirrell is one of the people trying to stop him. Yeah. So yeah. again, it is it is that un, it, he is obviously the antagonist, but he is so underdeveloped um, that it really it makes it hard to believe. He is so. I think that this is also the problem that I've always had is that it it makes it so hard to believe his depth because he was so shallow and will remain to to continue to be shallow until book three. Um, and even then, we don't get much insight until book five. We get a little mm -hmm. bit in book three. We get a lot in book five and a lot more in book seven. Uh, so it, it really does like he feels so shallow and and so it feels inauthentic and almost like J.K. Rowling's coming back and editing her character because that's what she's doing. Yeah. Uh, in her books. Yeah, um, she is. Also, and, and and that's not a bad thing. Like, you know, if you're if you're writing a, a, a long novel like this long novel series, the uh, the plan that you have, whatever outline you have at the beginning for how it's going to go, is going to change as you write it. Absolutely, yeah. um, like that's kind of what I what I assume is happening to George R. R. Martin right now, which is causing us to not get more Game of Thrones books. You know, he's realizing that the puzzle he's put together uh, actually is a little bit different when it's on the page than his original outline, right? Which makes uh, which that on top of you know the success and lots of money. Uh, means that there is no there's it's hard to get that creative motivation to finish the books right so I don't I don't think that you know that uh, that J.K. Rowling had any sort of like 
outline here that she stuck to or anything like that. You know, there's things later that come back, but but I do think that where she came up with a lot of this stuff was rereading the books and trying to put her own puzzle pieces together. That's what it feels like, and I'm, I'm sure that's what is happening here, because if she had actually had this outline from the beginning of what Severus Snape's character was eventually going to become as, as um, one of Harry's protectors, then um, then he wouldn't have just been like so overtly abusive towards Harry. I mean, he probably still would have been kind of a jerk because, and some teachers are jerks. Like, okay, let's be real. We've all been to school and we know not every teacher's good, but it wouldn't have been like this. There's a difference between being a bad teacher triggered by a student. Yeah. A, a, being a uh, asshole who shouldn't be a teacher and being a completely abusive human being. Yeah. And Severus Snape falls into that third category. <laughs> he, he is, in the first book especially. unreasonably abusive because there's no depth to him. Uh, and yeah. like I said, like, it's fun. And like you were saying, it's fine to go back and edit. Like, that, that's part of it. And also, Harry's growing up. So you can throw in that you don't have context. He didn't have context and knowledge and all this. Mm-hmm. But it's really hard to read this book and know that Harry Potter names a child after this man. It is. Okay, so that this is kind of but see the thing is for me because um because I I love Snape. I think he's a wonderful character. Uh and I think Harry's awful. <laughs> of course, I blame Harry for this. You know, I I think when I when I get to that part in the book, sorry, when I get to that part in the book, I'm just like I mean it is. So when I get to that part in the book, I'm like, "Harry, you dumbass." You know, but in reality, it's uh it's Joanne not knowing her characters because Harry would never do that. I'm sorry. Even if even if in his heart of hearts, he forgave he Snape, he would never it. name a child after him. He wouldn't. No. Sorry, go ahead, Landon. Oh, I was just going to say Ginny would never allow it. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> never anyway yeah Yeah. never so so like when i when i you know read that part it kind of like it kind of shows that um that the plan there really wasn't a plan there from there the beginning you know so it's kind of like uh it, it's this choice harry makes later is clearly like the author trying to reconcile that everyone loves this character even though he's a bad bad man and even though she's done none of the work to write him as a lovable character like that's the other thing too is and Again, this is a discussion that we'll bring up later in book seven. Um, The amount of actual writing to redeem Severus Snape and the amount of being told Severus Snape is redeemed is insane. There There is nothing, there is like three lines that redeem Severus Snape. And then there is like chapters upon chapters of us informed that Severus Snape is redeemed. And it's like, no, these things do not correlate. Three sentences do not redeem a man. Anyway. You know, you're right, though, because in this book, what happens is, you know, the way that we're supposed to know that that uh, that Severus is is not the antagonist is because Hagrid tells us. And that's it. That's all we get. All we get is Hagrid telling us. Now, luckily in the movies, we have the the wonderful portrayal um, of Alan Rickman. So you you know, when you see him, that he's wonderful and, and good and you should love him obviously i mean just look at the man they try to put that ugly wig on him and he's still like amazing <laughs> we love the 56 year olds play 30 someone in their young 30s i mean yeah <laughs> duh <laughs> nobody yeah. else could have done it though nobody else except maybe well yeah. i don't know how old he was at the time but what's that guy that um that plays lucifer in lucifer in the show anyway he has the same he's energy charismatic snape is not he's charismatic so- He's so charismatic. Oh my god. The, his character is literally the opposite of charisma. <laughs> he is a negative six charisma check. <laughs> yeah, you know what though? Even even with all of that, even with all of that, Alan Rickman, like still he still got it. Oh, he Alan Rickman it. is very chariz- charismatic, but Snape is not. <laughs> um it's all right. true. It's true. In the books, in because we're, we're really focusing on the books with these these comments that we're making, like there really is nothing in there to let you know that Snape's not the antagonist. Like he straight up abuses Harry. He shows favoritism. He he is an awful awful teacher, and yeah. and yet he's not the villain at the end. Harry still is going to have to deal with him next year, and that's how, what we're left with when it comes to Snape. There's no conversation between Snape and Harry. There is no um, there is no inner monologue of of Harry really trying to reconcile with the fact that he thought it was Snape because like why would he not? Snape has still been awful to him. You know what I mean? 
and there will not be like that's the other thing too is there won't be a conversation between harry and snake not really even when there is later it doesn't it doesn't really pan out that way no there's never a conversation between them there's snape literally grabbing harry by the collar and going look at me and that's it that's pretty the much yeah of their positive conversation yeah all right. Yeah, even though they have an opportunity to, but anyways, that's for a later book. To the second antagonist of this of this book. Oh wait, I have to say real quick. Um, oh. same Kendra, but I'm trash and uh, and love love a man that hates me, as you guys know. Uh, my choice in Stardew Valley is Shane. So. <laughs> cool. Uh, my I all of my computers except one have died, so I am no longer in the chat. I'm so sorry, people, if they are being entertaining in there. Oh, yeah. Katie and Kendra and Ty are being pretty entertaining, but that's okay. I'll monitor the chat. Damn it. It's fine. Um, anyway, second antagonist. Okay. Second antagonist in the books. Let's um, talk about Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Y'all thought I was going to say Voldemort. Wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's Dumbledore. Okay. So here's the thing. Uh, Dumbledore is very clearly... <laughs> Should I say it that way? Sure. Mm -hmm. Dumbledore has multi personalities in this book. He kind of um, does, and, and not in like the medical way, in like no. the inconsistently written way. <laughs> yes, because it's not purposeful. Um, mm -hmm. there is there is something about Dumbledore, and I think this goes to show. So here's where I think that Joanne shows her hand the most that she doesn't want to be writing a children's book. Uh, not even by breaking genre. Like the breaking genre is enough, but like this is the most outward showing is is Dumbledore well, the character. Before this, she never wrote children's books. It was all adult literature. And even after the success of Harry Potter, she's gone back to adult literature, right? Yeah. Um, well, you know, she just happened to have this idea, right? And so she wrote it down. We all know as creatives how that works. Yeah. Well, I think, so I believe what happened is that she wanted to market it towards young adult, but there, again, wasn't a market for it. So editors had her child it down. Mm -hmm. Like, she had it young and up because it was about well, an 11-year-old boy. Yeah, and I know she's talked about before, like, her, her original draft that, that she had edited was, like, way longer than what ended up getting released. So... The Dumbledore that we are told and introduced to in the first chapter, again, of, and something I, I didn't talk about with the genre, a very interesting choice that breaks genre right off the bat is the fact that we start this book not from Harry's perspective, uh, but about other characters within the world. Harry doesn't speak at all in the first chapter, and that is something very unique that didn't exist, that, that was very rare in children's literature prior to the 1990s. Uh, or the early 2000s even. So um, we are introduced to Dumbledore and informed that this man is the wisest and smartest and most clever man in, in the wizarding world. Um, that he is, that he is the one with the ideas that a very- He's the best has, headmaster Hogwarts ever seen, yeah. right? Best headmaster that Hogwarts has ever seen, that, that the uh, minister of magic has his ear and speaks his advice, uh, that this very extraordinary held and powerful woman McGonagall that we meet very, very briefly um, is very loyal to her, that this Hagrid that we meet who is obviously like built like a tank and is very strong is incredibly loyal to him, that he conducts loyalty and that he is pursued as this wise old man. The next time we see him, he is literally speaking gibberish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he and, and it's not like gibberish as in like lyric as in like riddles. It's that he's literally making up words. Yeah. He's standing in front of a whole school and being like, blah, 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 blah. And then like everyone eats dinner. <laughs> um, it's it is this incredible dichotomy and contradiction of these two characters of the the very wise old man and the kooky professor that isn't melded at all. You have It's like she tried to write Miss Frizzle and kind of missed what makes Miss Frizzle magical. Yes. Um and also gave him no like it, it's almost like 
the, okay, so the, the kooky professor is a trope that's fantastic. And if done properly, awesome. But here's the other thing, the kooky professor makes kooky choices that have really bad consequences that they then have to be powerful enough to make up for. Dumbledore doesn't do that. Throughout this book series, we don't see Dumbledore have a consequence. Uh, he has zero consequences for any of his actions, including leading Harry Potter to slaughter. Yeah, um, like he just lets that happen. Harry also names a child after him. Anyway, <laughs> the poor abused Harry Potter. Um, he and he would never allow this. You're right. That's the reality. <laughs> never. Uh, she obviously hated her second son. It's fine. Um, no, it's it, it is this like interesting contradiction that isn't melded you you see you see and you see and you not only see that jake rowling doesn't want to write young because she doesn't want to make dumbledore kooky because it feels like all of those kooky aspects are an afterthought but you also see where jake rowling doesn't meld or understand her character as well because you don't see the consistency of those characters it is black or white wise dumbledore or insane Dumbledore. There is no in between. Um, and it's not even that Harry sees only kooky Dumbledore and then we as the writers or, or readers see why is Dumbledore. It literally is a turn of a switch. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. Because if it was like, you know, Dumbledore from Harry's perspective versus Dumbledore from our perspective, then what would have happened is that we would have gotten, you know, a different Dumbledore in that first scene where they're dropping Harry yeah. the baby off and then a different Dumbledore the rest of the book. But that's not true. He he waffles between this wise and kooky thing the whole book. Like in the in the final scene, he's giving Harry a bunch of like wise old advice which we'll talk about that advice in a minute i got some issues with it but anyways that's what he's doing and from harry's he's perspective it's wise eating, whatever he's but also then, ears wax but like yeah. ear wax candy like yeah, and, and it's like <laughs> no and I, this isn't to say that like people can't have a serious and a silly side but dumbledore's not a real person he's a character okay and characters have different you know uh metrics that we should be judging them by and uh and whereas People, real people are typically not consistent characters we want them to be consistent so that we can understand them and their motivations and what the point is of their character and Dumbledore simply isn't he's very inconsistent and it's just I think it goes to show the the not developing him enough or or that he's like a figurehead he's she wanted she wanted an old man who was wise to give information to the young she mm -hmm. wanted a character that was worthy of saying love is the most powerful magic of all and didn't have one. Um, so why not give that line to Dumbledore? But she also wanted to make it funny. So why not also make Dumbledore eat earwax? Like it is this, it is this writer's undeveloped mistake uh, mm -hmm. in, in my mind at least. And because of that, you see, you don't get Dumbledore. You don't understand him, but not in a, because this character is un un ununderstandable but in a way that it's just like what is this character yeah and it's a it's a some it's something that an editor would help with right because once you've rewritten a draft over and over and over these inconsistencies and characters sneak in like that's just something that happens when you write a book right so um this is something that if if the editors would have realized what they had on their hands what a success they were going to have on their hands Dumbledore probably would not have been in the first book the way that he is in the first book at all because an editor would have said okay you've got some real inconsistencies with this character maybe you need to divide him in two characters you know or maybe you need to to pick one and uh, and w like which side is really more important you know yeah I also I I also think that this is again he suffers from the same issue that Snake did and that she didn't know Dumbledore's role to play throughout the entirety of Harry's journey Mm -hmm. um i like at this point i don't i she can say whatever she wants but i don't think there is anything contextually in the writing to prove that jk rowling knew that dumbledore was leading harry to slaughter um yeah. like she didn't know that um she didn't know that he was the manipulator behind all of uh, all of harry's mystery or uh, misery throughout the entirety of the series like he was just an old man. She, she didn't know his backstory. Like I truly don't believe she developed Dumbledore. And 
we see the moment as a reader when Dumbledore becomes important for the greater all storyline because that's the moment that Dumbledore actually gets background, actually mm -hmm. gets depth and consistency. And it's just another example that J.K. Rowling doesn't take care for her characters. The, her, her writing, world building is number one, plot is number two, characters are like four or five down the list. Yeah. Um, and and that's like her style of writing, fine. But in a in a world in which the fandom has gripped on to characters so tightly, she has she has belief of an authority over her characters that she doesn't actually exist because she doesn't know her characters. <laughs> it's true. I mean, and and I think I think this is a phenomenon of why certain things get massive fandoms relative to their popularity, right? Because there's other things that were just as popular as Harry Potter that didn't get massive fandoms. And I actually think having your characters be kind of met and your world being awesome is part of that formula, right? Because people then want to play in that world and they want to fix your mistakes, right? Yep. For some fanfic offers, you got you to give them a little something to go fix. And, uh, and I know for a lot of the Harry Potter fandom, and it's always been this way, um, to my memory anyway, is going and fixing character inconsistencies has been a huge thing since the birth of the fandom. Um, so I, I, in, on one hand, I kind of think that some of these issues with Dumbledore are that you see prominently in Dumbledore and you start to see with other characters throughout the series uh, kind of led to why the Harry Potter fandom is just as big as it's like... Um, I don't know what what do you call what do you call it like the popularity as far as like you know merch sales and theme parks and movies and yeah. like oh, that the, mainstream the, popularity. Yeah, the fanon the fanon and fandom is what made Harry Potter the success that it is. Mm -hmm. It is not it is not the works of J.K. Rowling. It is it is the it is the things that happened and the reaction people had to them. J.K. Mm -hmm. Rowling, and this is, I think, a discussion for later as well, because I think this deserves time and we need to move on with Dumbledore. Yeah. Um, this is something that I think talks about is that J.K. Rowling as an author and the creator of this world genuinely does not understand that the success is not because of her. The success is because of the, of the fans who want to run wild in her world. It's because yeah, of, I agree. Because like she's a wonderful world builder, and she describes the locations absolutely beautifully. That's what she did. That's what she contributed. Building the theme park, people love it because of the theme park. They do not love it because of her characters. So because she's gripping on so tightly to these characters that are messy and loopholed and aren't held together, and her own words are contradictions, and the way that they're written are contradictions, it's just not attractive. <laughs> yeah <laughs> bingo i think it's a discussion that we should definitely have yeah um, but this is this is the earliest this and snape is the earliest example of this okay so i want to i want to talk about um the mirror of erised okay because this is a part of the books that i really really dislike and part of it um comes from what dumbledore says to harry landon were you able to pull the quote for that if not i can i can say so i'm pulling it right what it now does. Uh, okay. Well, oh. while she's while she's tell me when you pulled it so you can read it out. But basically, the mirror of Era said the way that it's set up in the books is Harry finds this mirror that shows you know your heart's deepest desires, right? And he goes back to this mirror over and over and over and over again. And this could have been beautiful, right? Because it for Harry this is kind of like a drug, right? To see the thing that he wants because he never gets what he wants. Harry never gets what he wants. So now that he finally can experience what he wants. It's kind of like this for him it's this very negative thing that's like you know he really he he can't handle it because he's because of the life and the abuse that he's had right because we have this other situation where ron sees the mirror of erised and you know he's head boy and he's got the quidditch cup and da da da, da and all these things and he's more like mm, maybe i don't need to be spending a lot of time in front of that mirror you know maybe i need to be living my life you know the mirror was cool but we don't have to do it every night harry you know, like, um, yeah, that cocaine was banging, but we really don't <laughs> got to do that every weekend, y'all. <laughs> you know, that's kind of like Ron's, um, you know, experience. And he's very intuitive, right? So, of course, this is his experience. And Harry's experience is more about, like, um, you know, uh, oh, I'm getting what I want. I need this all the time. Oh, my gosh, I get, I'm obsessed with it. Da, 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 whatever, whatever, right? But then we have the Mirror of Erised explained by Dumbledore. 
And this is where I start to have issues because Dumbledore is supposed to be the wise man. Dumbledore is supposed to be the voice of reason, the character that has all the knowledge, the character that um, that we're supposed to be relying on to really guide us through what's happening here in, in reality, as opposed to from Harry's perspective, right? Which the book is written from Harry's perspective. But Dumbledore is like the, the outside reality perspective, supposedly, right? He's full of contradictions, but that's what he's supposed to be. So the way that he explains the Miravera said to Harry, though, I have a lot of issues with. Were you able to find the quote, Landon, or no? Can you remind me, was this in the hospital or was this? Because I am not finding the quote, but I will go look in the book very quickly. Okay. Um, it's either in the hospital or it's in the actual scene where Dumbledore it's is basically advising Harry to not look in the mirror anymore. Yeah, sorry about that. And then that. there's a there's a bit in the hospital, but I, I know what that bit is. Um because there's a specific word that Dumbledore uses in the hospital that I have an issue with. Okay, so that was the quote I was looking for. Are you looking for the um the explaining of what the mirror does? Yeah. So let me explain. The happiest man on earth would be able to use the mirror of Arised like a normal mirror. That is, he would look into it and see himself exactly as he as he is. Does that help? Um, and Harry goes, it shows us what we want, whatever we want. Yes and no, Dumbledore says finally, it shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desires of our hearts. You who have never known your family will see it standing around you. Ronald Weasley, who has always been overshadowed by his brother, sees himself standing alone, and best of all, all of them. However, this mirror will give us neither knowledge nor truth. Men have wasted away before it, ent entranced by what they have seen or have been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. Was that the one? So, so the way that Dumbledore is explaining that to Harry, it really takes it as if it's like somehow the mirror's fault that this is happening. That like people seeing their deepest desires is somehow harmful in and of itself. And I just really hardcore disagree with that. I can see why for Harry it's not the best idea. But for Dumbledore to basically speak this as if that's a typical um, experience with the mirror, like that's just that's just wrong. That is not how the world works. Trying to manifest what you really want in your heart is not a bad thing. It's 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 a good thing. We should all be striving for what we want in life. And this quote right here that Landon just read is paired with another thing that Dumbledore says in the hospital, right? And this is the connection that I'm that I'm making that makes me really. Um, angry with Dumbledore as a character in the way the Mirror of Erised is used in this book is he's listing for Harry, you know, good and bad traits of people, right? And he specifically says ambition, the word ambition as a bad trait, which <gasps> earlier in the book, that is connected with the Slytherin house, which is supposed to be the, the which is the house that Snape and Draco belong to, the, you know, the people that Harry doesn't like, right, that are mean to him. Oh, okay. And so like this, this idea that Dumbledore believes that this mirror is essentially dangerous and he believes that ambition is is a bad thing basically sets up Dumbledore who's supposed to be the smartest wisest character in the book as saying like don't go for what you think is is right don't go for what you really want in life just just live your life and I know that later you know, Dumbledore gets a backstory and you find out that I actually ambition really hurt him. So this is why he feels that way. But in this book, you don't know any of that. All you know is that Dumbledore is supposed to be the wisest and the voice of reason. And he's telling Harry that what you want, what you really, really want, you shouldn't spend too much time thinking about. Just live your life. Don't worry about what you really want in life. You know, whereas Dumbledore could have taken this moment to help Harry understand that, like, while, yes, your biological family is gone and the ones that are left are not, you know, kind to you, you can still find family here at Hogwarts. Like, that could, if Dumbledore was truly wise, I feel like that's what he would have said to Harry and he never addresses it. Joanne, Dumbledore is gay. He is the found family trope. Like, come on! Supposedly, but she doesn't realize that until later. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah, but yeah Ty, I think, I think irony you're... Verse, like... <laughs> oh, they're saying, Ty has a comment. So Ty says, um, I think the point was the mayor of Erised is that the perfection in the bear can be addictive and real life might not match up, but was poorly done. Yeah, you're exactly right. I do oh. think that that's what she meant to say, but I feel like that's not what she actually said. Oh, what she actually said is ambition is a bad thing. 
And here's the thing too, is that what JK Rowling wanted Harry to do was interact with a cursed object that had that had no negative consequences. Yeah. Um, the mirror of Paris said, okay, so in literature and fantasy, there are there are dozens of cursed mirrors, mirrors that you have to see your reflection, you hate your reflection, it's your heart's truest desire, and you go insane looking in it. Uh, and it's magic, like it's magically cursed to make you see it and not come away from it and not be able to walk away. Like all of those things that Dumbledore was implying should have been done by a curse, but JK Rowling didn't want to do that. He, she didn't want to curse Harry. So she then made it this thing about like men are weak and ambition will kill you. And that this is a bad thing. So stay away from it without the consequences of what was a really cool thing originally. Mm -hmm. And that- It sounds like, it basically what he sounds like, he sounds like that parent that's like, no teenage child, you cannot have a glass of wine with dinner because you'll become an alcoholic. Like that's what he ends up sounding like. That's what he ends up sounding like. Yeah, and I, it just, I wish, I wish that the mirror of Erised is such a cool thing. It's probably one of my favorite objects in the Harry Potter universe, because I think that there is so much depth in history that could be there. The problem is, is that it was written off so easily because it, it didn't have to be. Oh, we're just going to move it to a new location so you can't find it anymore, Harry. Sorry, you got to quit cold turkey. Then actually turns out the deepest desire of your heart is to get the Sorcerer's Stone. So like, fuck family, right? Like, yeah. it, it, it loses all meaning because of how it's used narratively, which is so frustrating because it's such a cool magical object. Yeah, it's like, oh, what I wanted in this moment was to find the stone. So it's going to help me do that. <laughs> But it's not it, really what you want. No, it's such a cool, like, it is, it's my biggest issue. But I agree with you, like, that it really is telling to not only Dumbledore, like, as a character to, like, fill in later, but telling to J.K. Rowling what traits she truly dislikes. Mm -hmm. and, I think, um, and I think that it's, it's very obvious that it's more about the author's opinion than about Dumbledore's opinion because he doesn't have a backstory at this point. So this is clearly like, you know, when the author writes a wise character and doesn't flesh him out as a character, what they're really doing is giving either what their actual opinion is or what opinion will move the story along. You know, one of those two things is what they're doing. So, you know, when Dumbledore overtly says in the hospital that ambition is a bad thing, and then he explains the mirror of Erised in this way, like those two things together means that, you know, J.K. Rowling believes that ambition is a bad thing, and I just disagree. Okay, if ambition causes, so I have one thing. I have one thing. So if if ambition causes somebody to like make awful decisions and do awful things, it's not the person and their ambition that's the problem. It's the system that they're living in that's causing them to have to do awful things to reach their goals. Okay, that's the thing. But she's not smart enough to understand that. You know what, Karen? That's a perfect segue. Beautiful. Let's talk about the houses. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, again, it's like this idea of directly the mentor wise man of the series that we have been told that no, we have not only been shown partially because we've also been shown that he's batshit crazy, but that we've also been told by several characters that the wisest, most informed person to listen to in the entirety of the series thinks ambition is bad and ambition is literally the easiest accessible word to describe one of the houses at the school that he runs anyway <laughs> so i guess he just thinks a quarter of his students are big dummies with bad yes. intentions <laughs> um so about that houses. <laughs> uh there's a there's an odd dynamic here um so I, we're gonna live discuss this. We are at 1.30 and we have a lot to discuss. So um, we can brief this or we can talk about this during the fandom. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, next week we're on, on uh, Interstage Window, we're playing Jackbox because um, Landon has a prior engagement. So that's when we're doing our community day this month. But after that, we're gonna come back and have a discussion about the Harry Potter houses in, in fandom. So 
We're going to put a pin in this. Hit us back up in two weeks. We're going to talk all about the houses. All about the houses. Okay, people that were real fast can pause the stream at that at that moment and see what all the points were. Um, but meet us back up in two weeks for, for that discussion because we still got another juicy one to come. No, and I, I mean, we have a lot to talk about with houses. So, and it's important, And but I also, we have more important things to talk about. Yes. Uh, for the final 30 minutes. So. Okay, so... We, let's let's be nice for a minute. Let's We've done a lot of bitching. We've we're done a lot of bitching. We're, I'm angry as a Slytherin, personally upset. <laughs> as a, as a yeah, my face is kind of warm. I mean, y'all know I'm super pale. I go I go red really easily. My face is kind of warm. What we've been talking about so far. So let's <laughs> let's let's gush a little bit. You ready for some gushing? I'm ready for some gushing. The world building is fucking phenomenal. There's no other word for it. It's outstanding. So good. So it's good. So good. And it is it is obvious that she is an incredibly talented writer with the skill and ability to create a world much like maybe not to the no, no, I would say to the detail that that JR that JR are Tolkien. Yep. We'll go with that. <laughs> that Tolkien was able to uh, create. However, she made it accessible at a lower level. Yeah. Um, and that is an inc that is a skill that I'm so fucking jealous of. Uh, <laughs> I want the tea. <laughs> I understand that she spent years creating and developing this world, and I'm so flighty because I'm a Sagittarius that I can't spend five minutes on one um that it's 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 amazing it's it's outstanding um and i know that we have some favorites that we want to talk about mm -hmm. but like and it only continues to get better mm -hmm. it is one of the things that like between everything like and this is expanding it but like we're introduced to this world but how even the wizard and the wizarding society and the muggle society politically are involved later in the series is like fascinating too there, oh, is, good. No, there is no ending to the world building that joanne is able to create that makes me love it really for real uh, truly and i am landon i want to stop you there real quick because um my i've got kittens in my lap they've actually been here the whole time and they're really warm so i need to move them because also i have to really have to pee and you can continue to gush about this while i go but oh. i just want to show you guys them first they're so sleepy here we gush go Say hello, guys. I can't. Hello. See I literally can't see anything. I'm so oh, sad. I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch the stream just for this moment. Um, no. So I think that um, All right, gonna, BRB. Yeah, I'm gonna continue to gush while you are while you uh, relieve yourself. Um, no, the the world is beautiful, and I am so angry. Uh, that I'm not angry. I am. I love that the books are being republished as as works of art, as uh, novels with graphics attached to them. And in the pictures here, a lot of a lot of these pictures are taken directly from the Sorcerer's Stone redo of uh, including the illustrations. And it is such a vibrant and colorful and creative world with new takes and new history that is accessible to all ages that makes it just so brilliant and bright um and that makes it worthy of having a freaking like theme park after it <laughs> there are no there are not many i don't i can't think of any other than disney uh, and even then they had to pay for it themselves a uh, world <laughs> that have theme parks named after them i'm so sorry if you guys are writing in the comments because i can't see anything no you're good uh, they're just talking about okay. the kitties they're what they're just talking about the kitties you're good oh, um, oh but good. yeah so like so like harry potter like the world of harry potter and why i think a, a lot more now in the branding you see like wizarding world instead of yeah. harry potter and and even removing jk rowling's name since she's so awful um and they really just you know because warner brothers still wants to make their money off of the series right so they'll say like wizarding world right and, but they also uh, they also wanted to expand to include um the TV show and movies that are yep. as well. 
Yep. But there's a big reason for that. And it's, it's obvious that, that that's where the, that's where the love is. That's where the magic is. Right. Mm -hmm. So like one of my, um, my favorite things in, uh, in these books is like the ghosts, right? That's one of the things that's like, I, I love that in a way that she really didn't have as much editing as she could have in this first book. Cause I feel like editors might've cut the ghosts, <laughs> but I love them. I, I think it like, it, yeah. Um, I mean, they basically did, you get like one little flash of one of the ghosts in the movies, um, when they're in the great hall, like he comes up, um, from the table and that's it. And then I feel like, I just feel like it's one of those things that like adds to the richness of the world. And even though it really doesn't have any consequences in the, in the books, like I know that Peeves has one interaction with Filch, um, but it, you know, you could have filled that in with anybody. It didn't have to be Peeves, right? And, uh, and I just think like, when I read that, it's just like so fun. And it's just this nice little way to really personalize the yeah. houses, um, as well as add to the world building. So like, just, that's one of those things that's just... It's so cool. It didn't have to be there, but she knew that the world was what was important to her. And so it's in there. And, uh, and there's other things like that too, but that's just one of the pieces that, uh, of the world building that I really love. Um, what's one of your favorites, Landon? Um, I mean, you, you spoke about it in your favorite thing um, about Hogwarts during Christmas time. But I think in general, um, Hogwarts itself, it is so... It's, oh God, it is this beautiful place that even though Harry is arriving for the first time, it feels like coming home. Um, and it feels like coming home as a reader. Uh, it, it, it's unique and special. Everything from the Great Hall reflecting the stars and the sky to the ghosts or the winding stair or the moving staircases, the portraits that talk and the history that's involved and and the winding secret passageways and all the mythology that exists within this castle that is ancient and old, but young and new at the same time and wraps both Harry as a protagonist, but also the reader up in its arms and makes you love it is so incredibly unique. Um, and it takes incredible amount of forethought and thinking and creativity to create a place that feels like that. Uh, I know that I take time to create characters that feel like that, but to create a world and a place that feels like that is is immeasurably insane to me, and it's beautiful. Um, yeah, and I, th I think, like, in addition to that, um, you know, that's kind of, like, what makes me so interested when they drop little hints about various things with the history of magic like there's one of my favorite of the of the various throwaway lines that add to the world um is when Hermione's like such and such goblin rebellions of 19 something something and I'm just like ooh, I want to know about goblin rebellions when were the goblins oppressed I, I want to hear about that you know <laughs> all right Ravenclaw well welcome you know no. what I mean I just I'm <laughs> repping today and uh no. and that's uh and that's how I feel like when that line is and, it, and that's one of many lines like that. I just well, think I, like, oh, I want to know more. And I think that's something so unique that that plays to both the genre, but also plays to like the accessibility to all ages is that if this was Tolkien, he would have then taken four pages to describe the rebellion. Um, and she didn't. She did a throwaway line that's like, oh, there's thought and, and purpose there that lets you clue in that this is a really well-developed world, but we don't have to know all the information. It makes us want to know all the information. Well, this is um, one small benefit of the fact that she didn't do a lot of, um, you know, background work and, and yeah. developing it before she started writing. So it's one of the benefits of that. If she had really fully developed things with her characters and fixed a lot of the things with the characters, then we might have ended up with something that had way too much detail, yeah, you know, in it. Or I think I also think that that plays into the fact that her editor said, we will publish this as a children's book, dumb it down. Mm -hmm. um, because if it had been published as a high fantasy novel or, an, or a fantasy novel in general, I think we would have also had that included because that's, that's within the rules of fantasy. It's yeah. not within the rules of, chi of children's no. play. Uh, and so you can that, spend a bunch of time describing every little detail of, um, you know, the banquet that they're having instead of it just being one small paragraph. Yeah. So that set precedent for the rest of the world, for the rest of the books. Mm -hmm. um, things like also Quidditch matches. 
all uh, love those itself, but also how quidditch matches are are written and and described and, and everything like that is just so full of life and so creative and beautiful that uh it really is it, it's this amazing well-developed world um i think that there's there is a little immaturity and not quite depth uh in this particular book because it's the first book mm -hmm. um because there is little to no interaction with the muggle world the only time that we see those two things cross is at king's cross and that's handled very childishly but beautifully like running headfirst into a brick wall is such a children's lit is just like such children's literature but also fantastic <laughs> yeah like i mean a kid would be like oh sure yeah of course just go really fast and they won't see you whereas an adult would be like um child you're gonna get caught you're gonna get caught there's yeah. no way <laughs> exactly and it's just it's this like it's this really cool it's this really cool world and it's beautiful and amazing and like I said I'm so I don't own them because I'm not giving JK Rowling any money so I'm not purchasing anything from Harry Potter but the fact that the illustration editions exist is phenomenal because these worlds do deserve to be illustrated forms which is also why the fan art community is insane and beautiful <laughs> Someday when she is, um, you know, no longer part of this earth, right? <laughs> Hold out for that day. Um, yeah. <laughs> or just hope that someone will maybe gift them to me. I don't know. Uh, oh, it's like from a <laughs> oh, no. um, But yes, for right now, this is, this is it. Yep. So um, yeah, I think that those are the beautiful parts of, of Joanne's world. And they only get more beautiful. And I'm sure that I hope that we take time in every stream, maybe not as in depth, but to talk about like how it develops because it does continue to develop in such an interesting way. Yeah, like um, I know I know that we're getting um, low on time, so we got to move on. But like just very, very briefly, I know one of Landon's favorite pieces is the dragons and like how there's yeah. they even already in this first book are introducing that there's all these different species of dragons and all this stuff. Yeah, or species and mythical beasts in general. I think that this is also incredibly prevalent in um, in, Gr in Grindelwald series. That's not what it's called. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Uh, mm -hmm. That's also interesting. Is the is also the relationship like of the dragons in the such a old world beast existing in such a new world and how they exist there uh, from everything from being caught and taken as prisoners in Gringotts to being able to be free ranged quote unquote in Romania is so fascinating. <laughs> but they're not really because the wizards have to make sure they stay hidden from the muggles. How they're how they're doing that in 2021, let spoilers they're not. There's no way. But <laughs> yeah, know, back in back in the nineties, uh <laughs> back in the nineties when these books are said in nineteen ninety one, um that's totally plausible. Yeah. Just give them a horde. It's fine. Right. Um, <laughs> so those are those are some of the beautiful, beautiful ones. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the not so great stuff uh, within yeah. her world. Uh, this is there is a lot of examples in um, her world that involves racism, uh, thinly veiled as it is, and bigotry in her writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the most popular one, as far as people to point out, and the most obvious, I think, is the goblin. So I've got a little bit on this. Um, I, this goblins being portrayed in this way, I think, comes from, um, or is most people are exposed to it first in the Lord of the Rings with uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and the way that the dwarves are portrayed. Right? It's very obvious in Lord of the Rings that dwarves are an allegory of what happened to the Jewish people. Right? Because even though Tolkien resists allegory, he did write a World War allegory that's what he did okay um maybe not intentionally uh but it's you know when you have experiences like he had in his life with the war you can't not right so um and and the dwarves are in a lot of ways a very racist portrayal you know they they love money they um you know they talk about their the the size of their features 
um, and they uh, and they are pu they've been punished for the greed that they had in the past and things like that, right? Now, I'm not not to say that Tolkien was anti-Semitic; he was anything, but he absolutely was not. But you know, sometimes we are also accidentally racist. Sometimes we're trying to be an ally, and we do the opposite of allyship. So when I first read Harry Potter. Um, not as a child, but as one of the rereads later in life when I had a little bit more perspective on this. That was my thought on the goblins in Harry Potter is like, oh, she's just continuing these these tropes that were said about by other fantasy authors. And she's not really a bigot in her heart. She just doesn't understand that this is bigotry the way these goblins are portrayed. Now, after everything that's come out, I wouldn't be surprised if someday we get some anti-Semitic rant from J.K. Rowling. That's how much her take has poisoned me. Now, instead of being like, oh, this is an unfortunate trope that she used poorly. Now it's like, well, maybe she is. I don't really know anymore. It's, it's really hard and multi-layered. I wouldn't be surprised either. Um, I, I don't think that it is, it's, it's, like not consciously intentional right she didn't try to she I don't think that she was like you know what we really need uh, a Jewish allegory for, or a, a Jewish metaphor in form of goblins like I don't think that that is is was her intention obviously I don't know her but it's certainly the truth of what is happening in her writing mm -hmm. um and I it's it's hard like you said because there is so much, I mean, there's so much racism and biasism in fantasy in general mm -hmm. uh, that it is hard to sit there and go, okay, what is tropes that she saw growing up? What is tropes that she read? What is from her own mind? And what is her bias? Um, and it's impossible to tell, but the fact that these are bankers who are very selfish and very uh, money hungry. And they're and that, mean. They're and, mean. And cruel and angry and ugly and all of these, and hooked nose and all of these terrible things. And it gets, that, and it gets worse in the movie. When you see it, it so when you bad. see them in the movie, it's like, whoa. The, the rhetoric is really hard to then, like the comparison is really hard to ignore at that point. Yeah. Uh, and if she wasn't, there has been enough talk about it that an apology or an, or a, or a, uh, like recognizing mistakes is, is should have been made at this point. We're 20 years later. Um, and if, if that hadn't been, if she had believed that, oh my God, I didn't even realize I'm an ally, my biases came out, this is terrible, I had no idea, absolutely, like a, an understanding or a public, at least a, a claiming of that would show allyship. She hasn't done that. Yeah, well, she used to say she was an LGBT ally and, you know, oh, yeah. so oh, I don't no, know she, that I would prefer a no, statement from her. I'm, I'm, maybe she should does. just shut up. Well, I, I agree, but I think that, like, that just goes to show more, right? Um, and, and, like, let's also be honest, she still does think she's an LGBT ally. Oh, I know. Part. So, I like, know. yeah, right, it might not be valid, but at least then it, like, would have been acknowledging it, uh, not to forgive it, but at least then, at least acknowledging it and there's none acknowledgement which just goes to show even more that i don't think she even thinks that there's a problem when yeah, she probably thinks of it the same way a lot of like dungeons and dragons players think of like the way that orcs and half orc characters yeah. are built in dungeons and dragons so for for y'all that that don't know much about dnd um intelligence is a stat in in D and 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 dnd takes a lot of inspiration from uh tolkien and a lot and other fantasy of that type right and uh and orcs uh, and half orcs, you can play them, and they have lower intelligence. Mm -hmm. In general, that's how they're written in the player's guidebook. And there's been movements and things to kind of correct that. Um, and uh, and Wizards of the Coast has made some moves that kind of fix that a little bit very recently. But uh, it's a trope. It's a trope of the genre. And uh, and basically, the point of this is that with everything that's happened recently with her, we don't we don't know now if she was just using genre tropes or if she has real feelings 
about this. She might. Kind of seems like she might, considering everything else. We just don't know. There is definitely, she definitely has feelings about, which is our next topic, uh, <laughs> which is reverse racism. Yeah, this is the racism that she meant to write. Okay, this is, this is the, the intentional, you know, things where she was like, I'm going to write this because I have things to say about it, right? Yeah. So um, in history, witches are and wizards are uh are obviously have been hunted down by many a witch trial and burned at the stake and all of these things because they're witches so she has taken that and has applied it to the muggle beliefs so the muggles that we see in this novel all hate magic we're going to go into the one of the characters individual reasons for hating magic but overall all of the muggles that we have seen hate magic yeah, they either hate it or they don't know it exists. If they, they know it exists, it. they hate it. And if they know it exists, they hate it. They actively watch the people who have it to die. They abuse Harry to the point that they're hoping to stomp it out of him. Like they, there is active hate and for this magic. Uh, but then we enter the magical world, the world that is supposed to be better and superior and wonderful and changes Harry's life. And the first character of this world besides Hagrid that we meet hates muggles. Yeah, it's Draco and in the robe yeah. shop, right? Yep, thinks they're disgusting, thinks that they're terrible. And, and we don't necessarily get insight into the depths of this bigotry from Draco Malfoy but it's on the surface and then it is made clear through the course of everything we learn for the rest of the chapter that muggle-borns and or muggles are the scum of the earth within some people's circles in the wizarding world. So like there's this idea happening that it's like, oh, muggles hate us and we hate them and no one understands and it's like almost this metaphor for reverse racism that's really gross <laughs> it's weird because it's just not how it's a very and these are children's books but it's a very childlike um understanding of racism that racism is just about there's these bad people that don't like those that aren't like them right because the the muggles that we know are vernon and petunia and dudley right and dudley doesn't have an opinion because he doesn't even know what's going on but vernon and petunia they dislike you know the the wizards and the magical people right yep. and um and and the reverse is also true right draco is an antagonist in the book someone harry doesn't like and draco doesn't like muggles right yep. so it's just kind of like it's like <laughs> the bad people are bigots that's what i that's what this is communicating and it's and not big about to each other yeah uh, and that's okay almost well, in a way that yeah well it, it it doesn't and, it, and this is again this is a kid's book so yeah. you know you can you can think like maybe we'll get more depth later spoils we spoilers we will not get more no. depth later <laughs> um we could have we could have but uh but basically it's kind of like it ignores all the the systemic things that are going on and um and in this world that that causes the wizards to feel like they need to hide from the muggles and, and live in their yeah. own separate world like that is never addressed and again it's a kid's book e oh. even like i wouldn't have expected it to be addressed and i still don't expect it to be addressed but as the books mature and as harry matures you start to think about like well why isn't this being addressed but isn't it's not it never really is you get a few throwaway lines here and there about various things um but it, it there never is a systemic addressing of why this is happening why the bad people are just like surface level bigots and there's no there's no system that kind of like makes this this happen you know yeah. it just it just is because they're bad people well and and it's also i'm going to show my harry potter nerd here i think it is book three uh quote me call me out when we get there that there is a runaway line that one of the witches that's being burned at the stake actually enjoys it because they she puts it under like a tickling spell so like there's this idea of oh you can have this under the systemic thing of racism and wizards having to hide from muggles but then all the information we get from it shows that that was never actually true <laughs> yeah it's it's but, just it's very weird 
that wizards have always been better than muggles. Uh, and even though that they're in hiding, which then is like, well, why are they in hiding then? Because yeah, but they're not better are... than muggles because if they have all of this, this magic, this, well, technology, really, that could help muggles and they don't use it, then they're not better. No, and like that's, and that's the whole point, right? But it's like this, but that's never addressed also. So it's yeah. like this, hey, we're supposed to be hidden, but there's no reason for us to be hidden, but we hate the people who are making us hide even though they're not making us hide and we are superior to them, but we're not actually superior to them. Like, but none of it is explained or addressed. It is all kind of just like shoved in the thing and being like, well, they're bad people. Right. Like where's, where's the like um, ancient wizard redlining policy, you know, where's yeah. the, where, where's the, like, you know, any, any of that type of stuff. Like that's just the, the thing that pops into my head is like a very obvious structural racism issue in our world. Right. But where is that in Harry Potter? It's not there. Yeah, it's it it doesn't exist. And I understand, like you said, it's a kid's book. It doesn't necessarily have to be addressed. But it is, it's like, but there is, I don't know if it's an allegory for it, but there's a very least a metaphor for it. And it's this interesting perspective that is never acknowledged, yet still consistent throughout every single book. Mm -hmm. We don't meet other muggles that do other than Hermione's parents. We don't meet any other muggles that don't hate magic. Yep. We only meet muggles that don't know magic exists or resent and hate people who can do magic. Yep. Um, yep. And and then all yeah, it's just it's just it's interesting. So I want to um, talk. I know we're at, we're at time, but the next piece yeah. I really want to go into. So this is another example of how like the the racism allegory in the book is super super shallow. Um, Petunia's experience. Petunia's experience, you're meant to take as like a, a, a racism type of thing, but this is not how racism works in real life. So Petunia learns about um, wizards and them existing when her sister gets accepted into Hogwarts, right? And her parents are so excited about this and it makes Petunia feel lesser and, and not loved and not cared about and unspecial. And so therefore she hates wizards, right? She has this very specific experience with her sister that she extrapolates onto the group, okay? And that makes a lot of sense. Like Petunia has every right to feel that way. She's wrong, she shouldn't be extrapolating that, but you can totally see why she would. She was young at the time, she was impressionable. She got the wrong ideas about what was going on with Lily because she had such a horrible experience, right? So it makes a lot of sense. But the thing is, racism in the real world it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. And okay, I'm from I'm from the South, the Southeastern U.S. So I'm going to talk about this in terms of um, anti-blackness because that's the one that's what I'm most familiar with, right? So people don't become racist against black people because they have bad experiences with black people. That's not how it works. You get you get fed these things, you know, through your uh, through your experiences and and through the media and through like the people that you know first and then you have the negative experiences that reinforce what you've already been that's yep. how it works in real life when people have these types of stories of like i don't like this group of people because they always do this and it annoys me or i or they or i had this awful experience and now i'm scarred or whatever like petunia is but the way it works in real life is you get told the problem is the group of people you have the experience with the individual that's part of that group, and then you extrapolate that that must be true about that whole group, right? And that first step never happens, which makes Petunia's experience valid and also just not saying the thing that J.K. Rowling thinks it's saying. So that's that about that. Well, and uh, I, She has no idea how racism works. I also want to like confirm that as well as someone who lives in literally statistically the whitest state in the nation um that's exactly how it is i know people who have who up until their early 20s had never met a person of color because there are towns here that do not have any people of color um and so all of a and sudden yet they still have like, opinions about those types of people right oh even more so even more so because they don't have anyone in their town and they've never been exposed so they have opinions that are then just led to like feed those opinions when they have any sort of interaction with somebody uh because they're also small towners so that means anybody new or a different experience with them is automatically bad as well so not only do they have <laughs> they have upon them the racism that is ingrained in those people's heads but they also then have 
the out of towner in them as well. So yeah. it is it's like this, this idea of Pertunia's experience is that's not, yeah, that's not how it happens. I understand it. I, I understand it and appreciate it as part of Pertunia's experience. I do not like it. The story that it is telling in J.K. Rowling's, right. uh, like in her storytelling. Right, because what, because what Petunia says, like a lot of bigots would say about why they feel the way they feel. Like, and so her story on first blush feels like very realistic. Like, yeah, that's what bigots would say about why they hate this group or that group, right? Or why they don't trust these people or those people, right? But Petunia's experience actually doesn't have the step one. It can't possibly have the step one where she knew of wizards beforehand, right? So it just, it makes it fall super flat and just show the, the lack of understanding of how bigotry actually operates in the real world. All right. So I know that we were saying that uh, Vernon Dursley or that Severus Snape was actually like Vernon Dursley's Wizarding World perspective, but I think he's actually Petunia's because like it's the same idea of this negative thing happens to me. So I'm also going to take it out on other people like that. Yeah. I mean, maybe Snape's a little Which both. Snape goes through as well. Not, not in the racist term, but as far as, as far as like, yeah. His I excuse for abusing him. Harry is because he didn't yeah. like his dad. Their abuse towards Harry is the same. Yeah. Uh, and 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 Harry and Petunia doesn't like Harry because of uh, it reminds Petunia how lesser than she is of her sister. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Last one that we want to talk about: um, Hagrid's portrayal. Um, so. In the books and within the novel, and this will continue and we'll point it out as often as, it, as we can, uh, the bad people within, Harry, within the universe of Harry Potter are described as ugly. They're unnormal, ugly. Snape is hooked nose. Uh, you know, Jacob Malfoy has slicked hair and looks like, and has like oil in his hair or something like that. Um, yeah, all the goblins are described obviously as ugly. Um, Voldemort is, is snake-like later on and is very ugly. So there's like, yeah. um, there's an idea of all- Also of weight, people. like if you're, if, you're, if you're overweight, that's described yeah. as a negative thing and yeah. bad people are Dudley, overweight and- Dudley and Vernon are both described as that. Petunia looks like there's something rotten under her nose all the time. Um, it, it's, this, it's this idea that you're, it's like your evilness is, is transforming you to be ugly. Mm -hmm. Only person who is described as ugly or unnormal uh, that is then portrayed in a positive light is Hagrid. Yep. And that is because Hagrid is literally referred to as a half breed. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, has a giantess for a mother and a human for a father, and makes him this half person outside of wizarding like he's already shunned from the wizarding world because he's not allowed to perform magic very isolated living on the Hogwarts grounds having no friends other than 11 year olds like very bad pers like presentation of him that is that like that half breedness has made him isolated from the rest of the world yeah and there we get more of Hagrid's backstory and more details on that in later books and we'll go into more detail on it when we get to it but um, but we wanted to mention him in, in regards to this because it's kind of like the only reason Hagrid is described as ugly is because of his half human, half giant genetics, right? And if he didn't have that, he probably wouldn't be described as ugly because nobody else that's considered a good guy is in this whole book. So it's well, kind of very telling. Yeah, and it's, it's once again also bringing J.K. Rowling voluntarily brings racism into her books uh which is another interesting choice for a children's novel uh racism is typically especially in the 90s was typically not a topic that was uh, written into worlds no like uh, you might get you might get like a, a very a very special episode of your favorite sitcom sometimes and things like that but you didn't get it as like the structure of the entire piece of and not only is there this racism or, or this like bigotry against wizarding people and non-wizarding people, but there's also this bigotry against within the wizarding world, even more so within people who are born of dis different descents. We see this again later as werewolves, uh, as werewolves are introduced and other magical mm -hmm. creatures are introduced. 
um, that it's like this underlying really just racist society that is never really developed or changed through the novel. It just exists, which is a very interesting choice. Yeah, which is why it upsets me that the structural things um, never get addressed because this is clearly an issue that is near and dear to J.K. Rowling's heart. And I know that she she has her own bigoted issues, right? But um, but that doesn't mean that she's not trying to be an ally to other groups in other ways, even though she is she's a bigot herself. But, you yeah. know, people are complicated and that's a whole thing, right? So I, I do think that she puts it in here because she does feel that racism and bigotry are bad and you shouldn't be those things you know and she's trying to help uh give kids a framework to think about it in a way that's that's safe for them and understandable for them so but, it just really upsets me that she that she clearly doesn't have a deeper understanding of what bigotry actually is even though it's like dear to her heart you know so like i, I don't know i guess I, I as i as a ravenclaw really struggle with like having something that i feel passionate about and that i i don't spend time um, learning more about and hearing from experts and keeping up with the zeitgeist on, you know? I also disagree with you a little bit on that. I don't think she added things like Hagrid being half giant, half wizard and, and the racism in there to teach kids about racism. Maybe with, with as later we go on uh, to like, purebloods versus muggles and and all of that yes but the underlying racism i don't because there's no lesson learned from there there's right. no change there's I, the only time you really see it is with s-p-e-w in the fourth. and that's even really weird we'll get to that and when we get to weird. that like that's almost like was the statement to try to correct things but like werewolf reform never happens in the book no hagrid never develops more sense of a community and is never accepted more by the people in the wizarding world. Like there isn't this resolving of that issue that if it was a purposeful lesson would have been resolved. It's just you're right. something that she chose to include in her world because it is so, because I believe it is so in her world uh, that, that a world existing without that couldn't be possible even though this is fantasy. And you mm. can't change the rules and expectations of fantasy uh, with, without having that kind of stuff. And then Maybe. that also then later goes to show how that choice is then contradicted with her comments. And we can have more discussion on this later when we have more time. But her comments about the fact that within the wizarding world in America, racism doesn't exist. Oh my God. So you have- <laughs> We can have a whole episode about the wizarding world in America and all the problems. I think we should, um, but she can, she could have a, a, she can invent racism in this world over here and then erase it over here. And that's why this feels so disingenuous because this world over in England is incredibly racist um, and, and has extra racism in it so so it's like this contradiction of she truly i don't think understood that she was adding barriers because it reflected her real world which really goes to show her own perspective and understanding of these issues mm. Mm. i mean i could see that i mean we don't know obviously we're not in her head oh. we're making guesses based on you know uh what we read in the books and what we've heard her say in interviews and and tweets and things like that right um, I guess I struggle to, when I see something, you know, brought up over and over and over again, I struggle to connect that the person might not care. Um, I'm a very passionate person, so that's a struggle for me. So you, she might not, you might be right. I have no idea. Um, well, she, but that's, that's where my mind goes when I see something brought up over and over and over. It's like, oh, this person must really care about that thing. And she might care about it, but she might care about it in a different way because I don't think it's to solve that problem because the problem's never solved. No, it's never solved. And it frustrates me. It frustrates me to and no end. It's not even never solved. It's never addressed. Like it's again with Harry's abuse. It's never. It's never actually said. Yeah. And it's yeah, and no that, one... And that is not because of a children's book abuse. Right. Not mentioning abuse is because of a children's book. That particular thing being added in and never brought up is not because of a children's book. Bingo. You're absolutely so, right. On that. Woohoo! We made it through. Final thoughts. <laughs> Small book, oh, thank you for the howl, Lunar. Hi, Lunar. <laughs> um, 
um, final thoughts. So we are not a review show here, um, especially because I read this book more than 17 times at this point. Uh, I can't review it. <laughs> uh, and also it's 20 years old. You don't care about our opinions. But we did want to talk about if this book resonates. And yes. Karen, I know that this is really important to you. So if you want to talk about the reasonings behind that, please do. Yes. Okay. So I don't believe in like numbers, systems, or star ratings, or you should watch it versus you shouldn't watch it or read it, I guess, in this case. Like, I don't really believe in that. I don't find that useful. Um, what really helps me know if I should go watch or read something um, is really the context of what the person has to say about it, right? So I don't ever want us to give a rating, but what I do want us to do is make sure that we make it clear overall what we think. And the best way I think to do this is to say if something resonates. So I'm not here to tell you if something is good or if something is bad or if something is like worth your time. I'm just here to tell you how it made me feel and what I think its effect on the overall zeitgeist was. So Harry Potter, did it resonate in 1987? Absolutely. My God, I was obsessed. Does it resonate now? Actually, yeah. For me, it still resonates now. It still speaks to that, like, you know, thing that we always, that all kids feel at some point, that they were unloved, misunderstood, and gosh, what if I could step into a world where, um, where, where, where I was understood? Wouldn't that be wonderful? It still speaks to that now. Um, so that's how I feel. So, so Landon, what do you, what do you think? Did it resonate with you then? And does it resonate with you now? Did it resonate with me then? Yes, of course it fucking resonated with me then. Um, <laughs> I, I have much love and, um, for this book series for personal reasons, but also because I was that kid who felt lost and isolated and wanted nothing more than to come home to an amazing school that wrapped its arms around me. I wanted that more than anything. So of course it resonated. Um, also, I swear to God, I wanted magic powers more than anything else in the world at that age. Um, however, does it resonate with me now? Uh, I would not pick up this book and enjoy it if I didn't have so much history with it. Again, not knowing if that's because I read this novel so much that I could start. You can't know now, can you? Right now, <laughs> um, <laughs> I I could I I could skim this book and and give you quotes chapter by chapter. Like it it really is that bad. So uh, I can't judge that. However, what I can judge is I think it resonates with the same audience that it had in 1997. I see kids pick up this book and still love it. I think that there are still things in there that really hold on to 11 to 13 year olds that want to escape. Um, I think that the world is still relevant and similar that it doesn't feel outdated. Um, I think that there is something magical still happening and there is a reason why this novel or at least this series would still be on the best time in best new york's best sellers list every single week if it was by sales there is a reason for that um it's it's magical so for me does it resonate no it's a children's book and i'm so tired of reading it um <laughs> but <laughs> to other people does it resonate yes and it is beautiful for doing that so that is my final thought on this book. Yep. So sadly, we can't just tell you it's awful because even though there's a lot of awful it's things in it that we've talked about today and we've done a lot of complaining, there's still a lot of good in it, sadly. Dang it. <laughs> and we will be complaining about the six more. <laughs> yes. So um, basically, just to let y'all kind of know our plans is we plan to have a media episode like this every month. Yeah. We're trying to hit the beginning, the first Saturday of the month every month. So that's that's the goal. We'll see if it actually pans out that way. Um, and we are going to continue to cover the rest of the Harry Potter books. We're probably going to cover one about every other month. That's kind of the plan right now. But it, it might change depending on, you know, what's going on in the world, other things that pop up. So that's that's basically what we're going to do. 
yeah, we're going to drag it out for a full year, guys. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> but that means since you know the schedule, if you want to participate in discussions like this, not necessarily on, on the stream with us, but in the chat or anything like that, we will set the date and we will tell you what we're reviewing or what we're talking about and dissecting so that you can be just as informed and have as just as many of opinions as us. Yeah. Um, if and you want to do this like a little book club with us, you kind of can. Yeah. I like the idea of this turning into a little media book club. Yeah. Uh, that being said, we are not doing Prisoner, uh, not Prisoner of Azkaban. I wish we were doing Prisoner of Azkaban next. Chamber of Secrets is my least favorite. It'll be fine. Mine too. Ah! It's the only book I really kind of don't like. It's fine. We can't. Spoilers. It's so important, but God damn it. Um, <laughs> it's the only one I've only read 15 times. Anyway, um, <laughs> we are going to do that. Uh, not next month. We'll do that the month after. What we are going to do next month is the Shadow of Bone series on Netflix. We're going to hyper-focus on the uh, TV show. However, uh, we will gladly take insight and into the literature works as well. Uh, I'm gonna try to read them before that just for informational purposes, um, but we're really gonna focus on the Shadow and Bone Netflix show. So if you would like yep. to read or watch that, not read it, uh, read the subtitles, if you'd like to watch that before our next show, please do. We would love to have you guys involved in that conversation. Yes, exactly. So yeah, it's going to be about the Netflix show, just so that you guys know, because um, I've started researching this and, and re-watching it. I watched the Netflix show when it comes out. Um, if you want to read the books as well, the books that this show takes from is not just the first Shadow and Bone book. This show is also a prequel to the Six of Crows book so if you want to so if, so the reading material if you want to do that i probably won't because i'm a slow reader i'm just going to rewatch the show and then um do read some cliff notes of those books but the two books are going to be shadow and bone and six of crows oh my yeah, gosh thank I, you so much for the biddies lunar ooh, i will most likely um be watching the series obviously i will read shadow of bone i might not dig into six of crows just because nothing that happens in the series happens in six of crows again it is right. prequel but I might um, see what's up maybe with that first book just to see uh, the characters. Who knows? Yep. Yep. So that's going to be next month. So that's going to be that first Saturday in July, which is, let me pull up a calendar so I can give you all an exact date. July 1st. <laughs> is it July 1st? Is that the first Saturday? Third. Oh, third, third. Yes, that's right. It's July 3rd. Okay. So that's how the media episodes are going to go. We wanted to make sure we told you guys a little bit about that as well. Um, but that being said, uh, what about, um, you know, kind of what's next? Where can you find us? Let's do the, do the last slide, Landon. Uh, the last, oh my gosh, you pulled from stuff. I didn't see this slide. I did. I did. <laughs> oh my gosh. It looks like there's an error. I ignore that extra Jackbox um, thing behind, behind Titus there. It's not there. I promise. It, it doesn't exist. I did this uh, last yeah. minute. I did this last minute. I love this. Okay, so you can find me at my TikTok at Land in Reverie, just right there. Uh, I pull tarot cards, and I would love to read your tarot. Just go comment on any of the videos, and I'll do that for you. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm being super active for the week, so who knows? Might be active next week, too. Catch me on there. That's also, that's in Land in Maine. Uh, and then you can just see my beautiful face on this show most Saturdays. Uh, but not next Saturday, because I'll be getting drunk at a bachelorette party. That's right. So um, in in a, in a, um, kind of in accordance with that, uh, we will be doing similar. We're going to be playing Jackbox here. So we're going to have our community day for the month next week, since Landon's going to be busy, and it's going to be Jackbox. So if you're interested in playing some Jackbox with me, then be here at noon. We're going to play all kinds of Jackbox party games. Oh, thank you for the applause, Kim. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and um, what you'll want to do is go in the Discord and uh, and get the party guest role. So I've got some, let's see. There we go, exclamation party. There's the steps that you need. So you want to get in the Discord, complete the verification in the readme, but most of you guys, I think, that are here right now are in my Discord. But you want to get the party game role in special access and follow the rest of the instructions there. That's if you want to also participate in the voice chat during Jackbox. Totally not required. You can just play without voice chat. I don't care. But if you want to also be on voice with me, that's what you got to do. So follow those instructions. And then on um, 
Oh, Lunar, I'm so glad that you're off and you're going to play with us. Okay, that's wonderful. Ah! <laughs> um, and then next Thursday, so this coming Thursday on Artistic License, we're still doing more Final Fantasy. We have basically reached the end of the game. Everything's opened up and we're doing side quests now. So we've got one more um, scene in the story that we're going to do. Then we're going to switch over to side quests before we actually end the game. So next week um, on Artistic License on Thursday, we are going to be doing that. And then, of course, also you can find VODs of all of my streams as well as episodes of Spare Room, which is my roleplay advice and help show on my YouTube channel, which is uh, is Karen Terry, youtube.com slash C slash Karen Terry, I think is the short URL for that. But if you put in Karen Terry on YouTube, I'll pop right up. You'll find me. That's all the places you can find me. And you can support me in all of the usual ways. Here's all of my socials. Boom. Y'all know how this works. I do everything the same way that every other um, <laughs> creator does. No differences there. All right, um, let's find someone to raid, shall we? Yeah. Hey, by the way, thanks for joining us on our first media stream. This was awesome. It was. This was really good. Um, I'm so excited for this. Okay, so uh, Landon, what are you feeling more? Do you want to do you want to watch some League of Legends, or would you rather watch um, some Ark Survival Edition? League of Legends. League of Legends. Okay, we're gonna raid Rival then. Okay, so that's going. Let me make sure he's not on a break or something. Okay, of course, I've got an ad. I need to renew my subscription for him. I don't want no ads on rival stream. No ads. Yeah, we're going to raid into rival. Lunar loves rival. He's great. Okay. Um, one last time before we do that, I want to shout out again that... Uh, Please, it is Pride Month. We are talking about works from someone who is extremely transphobic. So if you have the money, check out the Trevor Project. Uh, they're a really good foundation uh, and help support trans youth. Yeah, they need it. They need our help. All right, guys, go have fun watching some League of Legends. Here we go. And don't forget to make it a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. Bye, guys. All right. Bye, y'all.